uh, today uh, I would like to remember before the start of the webinar that uh, you can do questions and, and you receive the answer through the bottom for this in the Zoom, that is in the bottom of the screen in the right side, preguntas y respuestas. If you have an English interface, you will see questions and answers. Also, this session is recorded. And uh, we are going to pass uh, questions about the webinar at the end. And we thank uh, a lot if uh, everybody has uh, answered these questions about the, the webinar. So let me to uh, introduce the, the first speaker is Josep de la Puente. Uh, he is a geoscientist. He obtained a PhD degree in the Munich University and works in B BSc from 2010. Uh, he, he is mainly implicated in uh, R&D projects related with uh, your physical modeling, inversion, and imaging. And he has participated uh, in a long-term research project uh, with Repsol, developing uh, tools uh, for imaging and inversion in geophysical exploration. He has published plus of 30 papers um, plus of five book ch ch chapters. And he has participated in more than 100 present presentation in international conference. So let me give uh, the, the talk to Josep. So Josep, you can start when you want. So thank you very much, Jose Maria, for the kind of introduction and, and thank you to all the organizers of uh, this event today. I hope this is going to be interesting for all of you uh, so this is the first talk of uh, three today all regarding let's say some surface exploration with hpc and i'm going to try to try to start with a with a kind of an, an overview of what let's say role has hpc played in, in, uh, in the development of imaging for subsurface for subsurface exploration in the last decade Hopefully, uh, giving you uh, also a little bit of an introduction for the for the other uh, presentations that you will see today. So, first off, thanks to the Mexico project, uh, we have been able to collaborate between Europe and Mexico. This is has been funded from the European Union's Horizon 2020 program, and the Mexican Department of Energy has involved very many partners in several fields, uh, not just oil and gas, as, as we are, let's say. Uh, working today, but also combustion and other uh, topics related to energy production. And, and anyway, this is the, let's say our, uh, let's say our the project, which is funding this, uh, this activity today. So I thank a lot to uh, Mexico and let's start with, with the action. So oil and gas exploration is a business which uh, is related to finding uh, hydrocarbons, uh, whatever they might be, I mean, uh, both on uh, shore or offshore. So it, essentially what uh, the goal is, is uh, using data typically obtained uh, from active research uh, or sorry, uh, surveys, uh, seismic surveys, from which let's say um, explosions or, or bubbles let's say are generated, which uh, let's say produce uh, acoustic waves, which travel through the subsurface. And by analyzing those waves, we can let's say uh, obtain information about the subsurface, okay? The main problem of exploration is the huge cost of, let's say, of uh, drilling activities. It is very costly to produce one drill that can be, let's say, 100 or even 200, let's say, million dollars. And as much as we improve in technologies for drillings, those numbers are not going down uh, very quickly. So the only, let's say, hope that we have in order to, let's say, to make them more financially feasible, those, uh, let's say, those, uh, um, exploration activities, is by reducing the risk that, that is taken in one of these, uh, let's say, drilling efforts, right? So getting better information about the subsurface. To do that, we have to process the data which is acquired at the ships and interpret this as much as possible. And there are many ways to do so, okay? So this is an, a, a very simple scheme. Uh, it will be also helpful for the other, let's say, presentation that, will, that you will see today. So those sound waves, as I said, uh, are generated by an air gun someplace uh, in the ocean, for example, if we are offshore. And they bounce back at the surface of the ocean, but also at the different layers of the subsurface. In this, let's say that the waves which uh, come up again, carry information about all of these, uh, let's say, uh, geological layers, 
which this uh, wave has traveled from. And this can, let's say, be used in order to produce accurate maps of the subject. So the data looks something like this. So there's kind of a collection of uh, audio records, kind of like uh, songs, let's say MP3 songs or, or whatever you, however you might call it, recorded at different parts of a streamer ca cable, okay, where you might have different uh, geophones recording the signals. And we essentially want to transform those signals, which are expressed, let's say, in, in distance and time axis in this, uh, in this case, into something which gives us information about the depth. Okay? And what you see here is a slice, a portion of the Earth's subsurface at a scale of a few kilometers. And you see the stratification, the different layers, which might be, let's say, uh, appearing before the, uh, let's say, or uh, below the seabed. And these images are typically obtained just by uh, somehow uh, getting this time uh, data uh, that we got in our left side and using imaging and algorithms to transform them into depth information. Okay? Those strata, even at kilometer, let's say, uh, scales as the one that we are seeing in this, in this image, are very similar, actually, to the ones that we obtain at centimeter scales, let's say, in nature. So, I mean, this is kind of a, um, an interesting phenomenon, and we expect to see similar complexities uh, at these large scales also. So we want to do this not just for a small portion of the subsurface, but for very large uh, regions covering uh, oftentimes uh, hundreds of square kilometers of uh, the subsurface. And we may want to do this in three dimensions, and that is a very costly operation. It's so costly that we need typically very advanced algorithms, but very specifically supercomputers. So let's have a look at what an algorithm for imaging looks like. Okay, so this, this picture that I showed you about the, the, the stratification of the subsurface is obtained typically by algorithms which look like this one that you're seeing here. Okay? In the left part, what you see is, a, let's say, a simulation of waves which are propagating through the subsurface and they kind of interact with layers which have different properties, different velocities or different densities. Okay? In the right hand side, you have a picture which is the backward propagated wave fields which have been recorded at each of the, let's say, geophones of our survey. And whenever we make an interaction between the forward and the reverse modeling, we correlate those wave fields, we obtain what we call an image, let's say, representation for that single shot, okay? Now, the thing is we have a lot of shots, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of shots, and if we put them all together, if we sum them, or as we say in geophysics, if we stack the data, we obtain a full image of the subsurface. So essentially, we are simulating waves in order to produce images, okay? As strange as it might sound, let's say, for other, uh, let's say, activities in, in, in science or in research. So at the very core of the cost uh, and, and, and the very reason why we need HPC is because we are actually doing these simulations of waves. So we are going at the scale of meters, trying to discretize, let's say, the, the space, the subsurface, and we are running algorithms there where we solve the wave equation in several ways. We can use uh, simplified assumptions like acoustic isotropic wave propagation or more complicated elastic or anisotropic uh, representations, which involve, let's say, more complex equations to be solved and more, let's say, computational cost. And that is, let's say, the very core of, of each and every of the imaging algorithms that we're using nowadays in geophysics to explore the subsurface. Okay. Now, how do these supercomputers work? Okay, so how, how, do we, how do they stack up with each other? I mean, what's, what's let's say, uh, a, a proper metric for establishing how fast is a computer? Okay, that is a fundamental piece of geophysical exploration. How do we measure how good a computer is? Okay. So typically we use this funny word, FLOPS, which stands for floating point operations per second, which is kind of the number of sums or products operations that you can uh, carry out in one second, okay? Like a human person with a calculator can do about one flop, one operation per second. If you're quick, let's say, at typing at your at your calculator, you might you might be able to produce one flop, flops actually. Uh, but computers, of course, as we know, are much much better than than us in, in performing these tasks, and they count uh, the operations in the thousands of millions or the millions of millions. Okay, so here we have a very yeah, a rather old, let's say, supercomputer by, let's say, at, at its spike uh, by 1997, this was the fastest supercomputer in the world, it was able to produce 1.3 teraflops, uh, which means about 1 million of million of operations, okay, like 1 uh, European million of operations uh, per second. So that was a, a very, very fast computer, which if we look forward in time, in 
2013, we were able, let's say, to go to a shop and buy a console, which had actually exactly the same compute capacity as this supercomputer a uh, few years back in that. Okay? Time moves on in 2020, we can have a, yeah, a phone basically essentially having the same compute power, about one teraflop in your pocket uh, available with uh, very small, let's say, energy. And the most recent GPU cards are even so efficient and so powerful that even one fraction of their compute capability is already as fast as the supercomputer was not so many years back okay, in time. So actually just uh, one 25th portion, let's say, of the fastest GPU at the moment is just as powerful as the fastest supercomputer was in 1990. Okay? With the main difference being not just the space it takes or the cost of the acquisition, but also the cost of operation because you only need 14 watts to run this small GPU portion whereas you need 850 kilowatts to run this old supercomputer. Okay? So that is the reason why supercomputers are so important for geophysics nowadays. How we use these HPC resources can be summarized in, in, in very few numbers. So let's imagine that we're going to do this reverse time migration, this kind of generation of images by means of uh, supercomputing and, and wave propagation. And let's assume that we're going to solve uh, grids which are about this size. Okay, this is the amount of, uh, let's say, of pixels, if you want, uh, that we have in each of the dimensions, three dimensions, let's say, of our problem. And we're going to run this for about 20,000 time steps. This is a very high frequency simulation, but this is kind of the things that we can do nowadays. Which means we're going to solve this equation, which is a very simple equation relating pressure and, and velocity of uh, propagation of, uh, let's say, of waves. It's the essential, the, the linear the, uh, acoustic wave equation. We're going to solve this in 3D uh, for each of these uh, cells and time steps. And we have to do this twice per shot, as we have seen. We hit a forward and backward simulation. And we can have several sources, okay, like thousands, tens of thousands of them, okay, all together. So if we make the numbers, we have to solve this equation this amount of times, okay, where this 19 is the amount of zeros after the one, okay. So this is a huge number of times that we have to solve this equation. It's always the same equation. That's a nice thing. So we can optimize very much this operation, but still it's a huge, crazy number of operations. Now, this equation takes about 100 operations uh, per solve. Okay, if we make the numbers, if we decompose this and use the, let's say our typical algorithms, uh, we end up in about, on the order of about 100 operations per equation. And also we know these algorithms are not uh, astoundingly efficient, let's say, in terms of using all the resources of the supercomputer. So we are about, let's say, roughly 10% efficient. Okay, these numbers may, might vary, but let's, let's edge this rough uh, number. So this means that we need to be able to solve about 10 to the to the 22, let's say, amount of operations in order to solve this image. Okay, this is just one image of, let's say, of the subsurface for a large region and at high frequency, but you get the size of that, okay? So if we use the complete system installed in Barcelona right now, Modern Storm 4, which is one of the still one of the fastest computers in Europe at least, it would take about 10 days, okay? And exclusively that devoted to performing this task, okay? Of course, we know that we're gonna install a new machine in a few years and it's gonna be much faster. We can probably do this same operation in a fraction of a day, so again, several hours, okay? Computers go faster every day, but still the amount of compute uh, required for these operations is huge, okay? Now, still, this is the problem of producing an image, but this is not the state of the art in imaging. What we're doing at the moment is full waveform inversion, which is kind of asking the question of just, not just where are, let's say, the reflectors, where are the straight out, how do they look like, let's say, the geology of a, of a given region, but what are the actual properties, the physical properties of the models, which, let's say, give us the information about the properties of the subsurface, okay, directly, okay, through treating them in terms of an inverse problem. And this very much looks like a reverse time migration algorithm inserted into an optimization algorithm, which loops through several frequencies, uh, several iterations or optimization steps, and it requires certain, let's say, line search operations. And you might end up having the cost of several hundreds of migrations, which as we have just seen, are extremely costly operations. We might do that at lower frequencies, of course. We might, let's say, play several algorithmic tricks but this still is huge amount of computing, let's say, required for solving the problem in one, just one region okay, that, that we might want uh, information for. Now, uh, there is one thing which plays in our favor in geophysics, which is the, let's say, steady growth of HPC uh, as a resource, okay? If we think of uh, computing capability or, or the, let's say, the amount of compute power that we can harness, this is, uh, let's say, a commodity which is growing, let's say, steadily, 
uh, with time. Okay, and this what you see here is just a, a, let's say a, a way to, to to visualize this in terms of the list of the 500 fastest supercomputers in the world every year. Okay, every year we have two measures of this. Okay, that we publish a new list of the top 500 uh, supercomputers. And in blue here, you see the fastest supercomputer at the time of this, uh, let's say this, this was published. In the, let's say in the yellowish or orange line, you see the 500 computer. So that's, let's say the, the, no, the, the slowest among the fastest, let's say, uh, supercomputers in the world. And the top line, the one in, in, in purple color is kind of the sum of the speed of all of these 500 systems altogether. Okay? And you can see that there's a, a trend which is aligned in, an, in a logarithmic scale. So this is kind of an exponential growth okay, that, that we are uh, seeing in terms of the growth or how faster, let's say, are becoming these machines uh, with time. Okay? This was not really up to date. So I just uh, gave you here, uh, let's say, the, the, the latest numbers, which will be updated actually in a, in a month's time from now. So you can see that the fastest supercomputer at the moment is about 400 petaflops. Okay? This is about 40 times bigger than, let's say, than Mara Nostrum uh, 4 at the moment. Uh, you can see that the trend also has gone a little bit, uh, let's say, out of the, this line, let's say. So, I mean, although this, probably the fastest supercomputer still is kind of in the line of the, let's say, of the extrapolation of growth of, uh, of uh, supercomputer power, the other two have fallen quite uh, dramatic. Okay, so it's becoming increasingly costlier to produce these supercomputers and it's ever, let's say, a little bit more difficult to produce them. But still, this is a growing trend which is not stopping. And this means that we can have more resources available with time, but it also means that computers get old very quickly. So you have to like, adapt your algorithms and be always trying to fight this obsolescence associated with this computer. Okay. Now, web simulations uh, have their own, let's say, uh, economy of scale regarding computing. And this is the standard way in which we can measure that. Okay. So if we have a certain problem that we want to solve at a certain frequency and we want to double that frequency, we have to multiply the CPU cost by 16 times, okay? Costly, okay? I mean, it's an estimate and it depends on the algorithm, but this is a quantity which kind of holds, okay? And we can use that to make a couple of interesting, let's say, uh, findings here. For example, uh, we can, uh, for example, we can get to know that the fastest supercomputers, okay, have a certain speed, but if I go, let's say, to buy the fastest CPU in the market for, let's say, to bring home, I can buy something which is about 10 times, uh, 10,000 times slower, which is, is not huge, which in terms of frequency means that I can run the same problem that I would run in the whole supercomputer, but at 10 times less frequency, which is not too bad. Maybe I can do something at 20 hertz, let's say, at a supercomputer, so I can reproduce the very same thing with my own, let's say, GPU home uh, at, the, at 2 hertz instead of 20, okay? which is also not, not a bad idea. Or I can just uh, sit and wait uh, for computers to grow faster and hope to buy the next big computer in 15 years time. And I will be able to get this same uh, frequency jump by doing, not, doing nothing and essentially just waiting for the next computer to show up. Okay? So in terms of uh, the ecosystem, so what's happening nowadays in the exploration industry, and this is taken from a, a very nice report by PGS uh, last year, we can see that there, this company, which all of them are part of the, let's say, of the geophysical exploration world or the oil and gas industry, if you want, all of them have systems which qualify in the top 100 uh, supercomputers in the world. Okay, so ENI has the sixth fastest uh, computing system, uh, and also the 19th, and also the 81st. Okay, it has a couple of systems together. Total also has two systems in the list. Petrograd has also two of them, and PGS has this one plus another, which is kind of a uh, let's say a second system, uh, although split into two parts. So all in all, about 10 uh, supercomputers, which would qualify as one of the 100 fastest uh, supercomputers are used almost exclusively for producing images and inversions such as the ones that I described before. A little bit also of preserver modeling, but that's, that's not really the goal of this supercomputing uh, system. It is mostly imaging and uh, in inversion that they are doing. So in terms of architectures, I mean, the trend has changed uh, quite a lot. This is, uh, let's say, the share of uh, use uh, of different uh, solutions for accelerators, which is the, the main trend if you want to have a uh, supercomputing at the cost, at the budget, and that's what you typically do if you're a private company, you are going to want accelerators in your system, okay? If you do that, uh, you can see that, although there used to be different, let's say, options in terms of accelerators a couple of years back, 
nowadays almost everything, all accelerated systems almost are essentially NVIDIA systems. Okay, so NVIDIA has taken the, the, the market of accelerators quite uh, strongly and has now uh, I would say a strong hand in, in, in controlling what uh, the HPC market is. Okay? So I would like just to give you some uh, concluding remarks uh, before jumping into, into any questions that you might have, and, and I'll be happy to answer, of course. So first off, of course, HPC, um, I was thinking here, uh, if I should write it, it, it has been one of the key enabling technologies, but I, I, I don't think it has been one of the key enabling technologies. It has been the main uh, enabling technology for geophysical exploration in the last decade, without a doubt, okay? Without HPC, many of the imaging algorithms, which uh, let's say now are producing, let's say, or, or being able to reduce the costs of many operations of this companies would just not be possible. And you cannot compensate that just with data. Plus, data is much more expensive to acquire and to obtain than having those algorithms, algorithms in place in HPC systems. So definitely HPC has been the, the, the let's say, the, the fundamental uh, contributor to geophysical exploration in, in the last decade. At the very core, I mean, just to keep uh, this idea clear, I mean, wave field modeling is the reason why HPC is needed. Not just the imaging algorithm, algorithms per se, but 95% of the time of these algorithms, what they are doing is simulating waves. And that is the reason. So they are essentially solving the acoustic wave equation or any derivative of that inside a complex workflow, which tries to, let's say, get the best possible models of the subsurface. Okay? Now, a note to remember is that uh, HPC um, it has this both sides. I mean, on one hand, is a resource which is ever growing, faster, let's say, steadier than any other resource probably that we may know okay, about. But this is also a challenge, let's say. It's also a challenge for people which depend on HPC because this technology becomes obsolete very quickly. So we need to both acquire new systems rather frequently. I mean, the lifetime of an HPC system is three, four, five years time. After that, they become just inefficient. Plus, on top of that, we have to adapt our algorithms to these new technologies and be constantly, let's say, in a, in a, in a circle of uh, making them uh, efficient in these new architectures, and that also has a cost okay, in terms of uh, maintaining and, and the uptake of these technologies, of course. And now some very few uh, brief notes, let's say, which uh, also I think are, are relevant for today's webinar, and is what, what probably is in stake, let's say, the future for HPC. So if HPC now is a, is a centerpiece for exploration, so what about probably the next decade? What, what are we going to see? So definitely one of the biggest things is gonna be integration with uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence technologies for many reasons. One of them is in terms of, of course, of interpretation. There's a part which is up to interpreting what let's say the outcome of this, uh, of this uh, images is. And there this technique of artificial intelligence has a lot to say, let's say in terms of classification and, and, and understanding let's say of those images. But not only that, I mean, machine learning and these uh, tools can help us uh, even accelerating or modifying or, 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 or streamlining many of the workflows which we already know. And, and they can contribute at many steps and they are key uh, fundamental pieces of technology to be adapted to the workflows in the future. The problem is that the ecosystem of HPC and that of machine learning are not really overlapping that much. They both rely on computing, but they do computing in different ways. And let's say that there's no easy or simple way, let's say, to interact uh, between both, let's say, which has been established, let's say, by the community at the moment. Okay, So this is still a challenge, let's say, for, for, for many people. Of course, improving the algorithms, that, that will happen in the future. FWI is a, is a great tool for imaging, but it has its limitations in terms of the requirement of initial models, in terms of uh, needing, uh, let's say, uh, low frequencies, in terms of ensuring conversion, so that has to be improved and not only FWI, but this, this squares at the end and so on. And probably the end of the picture is uncertainty quantification, what is, uh, that is probably the, the end road, let's say, for HPC and geophysical exploration. Being able to assess exactly, let's say, how well or how badly are we assessing the properties of the subsurface. This is costly, we will use HPC for that, and that is probably the ultimate goal. And just to remind you people that you are very lucky to be in today's seminar because Actually, two of these topics, which is machine learning and FWI, you will see uh, presentations right after this one. So stay tuned and you will hear a lot about what's going to happen next in HPC and exploration. So thank you very much. That was it from my side. And yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Josep. I have a question uh, related with uh, the journey inversion how to combine the information of different waves, like electromagnetic waves, 
and elastic ways. Uh, is somebody today in the industry taking this path? Okay, so from, from what I've seen, uh, I've seen many use cases, let's say, uh, where a joint inversion is working, I mean, like uh, examples of it working, but not a generalized approach to solve any case, okay, which is what, let's say, people are expecting, kind of a, like a, a way of, for example, a WI is rather universal, let's say, but the joint, let's say, simultaneous joint inversion of, uh, uh, of seismic and EM still seems like something which requires manual interactivity and that is not really what we want. I mean, we would like to have algorithms which are, let's say, automated somehow and can give us information uh, yeah, in a more natural way. So I think there's there's some some way to go also in this in this direction for sure. And today we are able to make inversions also in uh, viscoelastic waves. Uh, we have arrived to the end of the research in this area. There are more complexity that we can introduce in the physics to obtain better models or images. So in, in the physics, probably the, the next uh, you know, uh, level would be going into, let's say, uh, models which are more giving us more information about the pore structure, let's say, about the interaction between fluids and, 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 and solids. So kind of poroelasticity and derivatives of that. Okay. Now, uh, it's this is, let's say, a game of diminishing returns. So, I mean, let's say from, from, from nothing to acoustic is a huge game. From acoustic to elastic is a little bit better. And then there's a point where you're adding complexity, but you know the, the, the amount of benefit out of it is, is, is just too small. So, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to see this, uh, let's say, um, dominating the industry in the future. Probably that's too much. We're going to go better into uncertainty quantification, which is something which, which we need much more probably than the than more complicated physics. Okay, and what's your opinion about uh, reducing the complexity using uh, techniques like reduce order models? That is definitely what uh, one of the, the, the biggest probably uh, developments in the future. So I, I think that there, there are many ways to, to do that. And actually, I mean, if, I, if I may, I can, I can try to find a, one slide which explains a little bit of this or, or how can this be relevant. So the digital models now are in a kind of in a struggle or in a fight with machine learning, essentially, which they do. You, you can get also reduced model or surrogate models using machine learning uh, techniques, which are also very efficient and also very competitive. But you lose a little bit of the, let's say, of the detail on how you got or how you obtained those models. I mean, there's a kind of a, a black box approach, which is not necessarily something which people uh, get to like. Okay? So just if I may, just for a minute, uh, share with you this, this image. I mean, this is an example which uh, which we ran uh, some time ago. So this is an example of eight-dimensional modeling. Okay, so let's assume that you have subsurface someplace, and then you have uh, several layers. Which let's say the properties of each of these layers might be unknown, globally unknown. Okay, you, you don't really have an idea of what the exact velocity is at, at each of these layers. So we can use uh, what is called reduced order modeling to uh, model in an eight-dimensional space. So it's just two dimensions here, but also we are varying the frequency between uh, one to three hertz, for example, and the properties at each of these layers independently by plus minus 10%. Okay? So if we do that, it is expensive to run it, but then we have a generalized solution to this problem. And that is actually cheap. Okay, So if we compare here what we need to, the amount of simulations needed to populate this reduced order model, which is about 500, uh, sorry, 5,000, comparing this to sampling with just 10 points, each of the dimensions, let's say, involved in here, this is, let's say, a, a huge benefit already, okay? It's 5,000 against 1 million simulations, just for this toy example, okay? So, yeah, we, we are we are trying to work on this and, and trying to make, a, let's say, a scale up of these problems into 3D, into a higher complexity. They don't parallelize too well, this, this problem, that is the fundamental problem that we're having at the moment. If we can make these problems parallel, we probably can get a, a huge benefit in the in the coming future. Okay. There is a question of Norberto Ochoa. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked, "What is the precision needed, and what are the most used methods?" Okay, so I guess these are two different questions. In, the, in terms of method, I, I, I guess this is this relates to the the forward modeling. I guess so. The most popular still are graded methods because they are very simple. Uh, finite differences, pseudospectral, those typically are, are still the, the most popular because of their simplicity and and because they can be easily adapted to different uh, computers but but there are other technologies which are also uh, like uh, spectral elements are becoming popular nowadays uh, finite elements of high order of other natures also are becoming popular 
And in terms of precision, I mean, it, it really depends on the algorithms. I mean, let's say in the, the internal uh, precision of these algorithms, typically just with single precision, you are fine. And you can even drop from that. Okay, at some parts of the algorithm, you can you can you can do with less. Okay, than, than single precision. In terms of the let's say the resolution of the resolving capacity of the or I mean, let's say or, or how accurate can we be in our predictions of the models, errors are still large. Okay, we, we can have errors about twenty percent, let's say in the you know, in the in the models that we retrieve at the subsurface. Plus the resolution can, could be better. So yeah, that's that's a long way to go still on this in this area. Okay, thank you very much again, Joseph. And we are moving forward to the next presentation. Uh, so, so the next speaker is Ursula Iturran. Uh, he has a degree in mathematics by the UNAM in Mexico and a PhD degree in computer science for, from the Imperial College. Uh, he has worked in, 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 in Instituto Mexicano del Petróleo. And from uh, 2010, uh, she uh, has been uh, working in Facultad de Ciencias de la UNAM. Uh, her, his, he, uh, her main interest uh, is uh, numerical modeling of wave propagation and machine learning for geophysical applications. So Ursula, uh, when you want, you can start your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for, for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see yeah, the... We can see. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> today I will talk about machine learning for geophysical exploration. Um, here is the, the contents of my talk. Uh, a bit of an introduction to machine learning and the tools to apply machine learning, current tools to apply machine learning. Uh, the problem description, uh, the data that I be used uh, for this application. Uh, I will briefly talk about something that is called the gamma test, which is a, a tool to, to choose the better inputs for, for a neural network. And I show some uh, results uh, for the petrophysical parameter estimation at seismic scale and uh, some brief conclusions. <clears throat> so first, uh, we should talk about what is artificial intelligence or more, even better, machine learning as a subset of, of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence uh, 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 has a lots of uh, different methods that are broader than machine learning. And machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, within machine learning, you can find supervised and non unsupervised uh, neural networks. Uh, and uh, the, the conditions that you need to apply machine learning for different problems, first of all, is that you need a data set. And then also you, you know, or you suspect that there are some patterns that exist in the, in the, in the data. And <clears throat> there's no a mathematical formula that can fit or can explain your data. And the idea is to learn from, from the data that you have. And uh, you have different, uh, uh, for example, data, main, data mining is, is one of the methods to extract knowledge from, from the data that you have. And sometimes, or most often the data is very complex, so there's not a single way or a simple way to explain what you see in the data. Uh, so in machine learning, you have all kind of uh, uh, methods and some go from very theoretical uh, explanation of, uh, on how the, the machine learning or neural networks work and others are very intuitive or just like practice, practice uh, rules of thumb. Uh, so you have the data mining, the applied statistics and the machine learning uh, in, in, in an intersection for data science. So what are the problems that you can, you can uh, tackle with, uh, with the machine learning or neural networks? Uh, basically, you can you can say that there are three kind of problems that that, that you can uh, solve with with these methods. One is classification. Uh, 
you have uh, here groups of, of, of different things that you can say this belongs to one set and clearly this belongs to another one with different characteristics. So this is the classification kind of problem. Then you have also the clustering where you, you don't know the class, but you can see these are closer to each other than this other part of the sets, the, the data. So that's the clustering. And, and then the other one is the regression or nonlinear regression, where you can fit a, a, a set of data. Here's like a linear regression, but it's, it's, non, no, it's in general nonlinear regression. So you don't have a, <clears throat> a, a, simple, a simple function to explain your data, but you can, or you are able to fit it. So here in, in my talk, I will, I will talk about some of the data to do nonlinear regression. Uh, and then you have the, in the machine the in the machine learning algorithms uh, you have uh, like two as I as I said before two different uh, paths either you have <clears throat> unsupervised learning or supervised learning and that depends on the data if you have labels for your data then you have unsupervised actually you don't have labels for the data you you have unsupervised learning and if you have labels for the data you have supervised learning uh, <clears throat> basically supervised learning is you learn from an example and you have the label the data so you know the right answer and you can train your neural network to say this is how you should perform and in the other case you don't have labels for your data and you just uh, put the data to the, to the neural network and the neural network has some uh, algorithms that allow them to learn from the data, but it's only, it's not supervised because you don't have, uh, you, you, you don't have uh, the examples of the label data. And well, from supervised and unsupervised learning, you have, <clears throat> in, a, in supervised learning, you, you can do classification, as I said before, or you can do regression and classification. Basically, you, <clears throat> you have to uh, select the class that you, that you want. And uh, you have neural networks and you have uh, logistic regression, random forest, super vector machines. In regression, also, you have super vector machines or neural networks and uh, random forest and, and other methods. And on the on the unsupervised learning, you have clustering, uh, k-means or uh, self-organizing maps, uh, and also you have uh, lower dimension like uh, principal component analysis or autoencoders. Now uh, there are lots of uh, uh, problems related to image recognition. For example, you have a seismic image and you want to. Um, say where are the, the fractures and uh, you can train them with uh, unsupervised learning, uh, convolutional neural networks, and you can uh, uh, have a, a very, very good uh, uh, classification or good uh, selection where your fractures are. <clears throat> and, and well, the tools to apply deep learning or neural networks uh, nowadays, uh, you have very good options. Uh, you have Keras and you have TensorFlow. Before, uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, Keras and TensorFlow were a bit uh, separate. Now they, they talk, they are more friendly to each other. Uh, uh, Keras is on top of TensorFlow. Uh, but now, as I said, now they're more friendly. They talk to each other better. Uh, and also there are other, other tools like PyTorch, which is also a very good option. This is for, for neural networks, but also there's a very nice tool uh, in, in Python, uh, which is called scikit-learn. Uh, scikit-learn has lots of methods to do classification, clustering, progression, uh, dimensional reduction. Uh, so you can also do neural networks with uh, scikit-learn. Uh, you can do deep neural networks as you can do obviously here in Keras and TensorFlow. Uh, 
so the the tools that I recommend for 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 this are uh, in Keras and well Keras and TensorFlow. And uh, sometimes Scikit-Learn provides a very good um, uh, models or initial models for 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 exploring what kind of architecture or what kind of method you want to use. <clears throat> and uh, the 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 zoo of the neural networks has improved since I don't know fifty years ago. Uh, in nineteen sixty seven was the first one. Uh, Frank. Uh, uh, Frank, uh, no, Minsky and Popper, 1968, were the first to publish the, the, the famous book on perceptrons, that the, that the perceptrons are the, like the ancestors of deep neural networks now. And the perceptrons have like one or two hidden layers. And Minsky and Popper were the first to, to prove that the, the, the perceptrons were able to perform nonlinear regression. And uh, from, from, from then, a long time ago, the neural networks have evolved a lot. And now they have uh, amazingly uh, complex uh, architectures and training algorithms. So you have uh, recurrent neural networks or long short term memory neural networks or deep feed forward neural networks or autoencoders, convolutional neural networks. And the architecture and the, and the learning algorithms depends on the problem that you want to, to solve. So sometimes, for example, for images, convolutional neural networks are very efficient. But for example, for time series prediction or uh, yeah, basically time series prediction, you have the long, long short term memory neural network is a very good option. Uh, all of these are, for example, now we are talking about deep neural networks because deep because they have lots of layers hidden with lots of neurons inside. So before, I mean, 50 years ago, where, where, when the perceptron was uh, proposed, uh, no one could even think about having a deep neural network was like a dream. Uh, <clears throat> now, because we have more computing power, we are able to, to have uh, deep, uh, deep neural networks. And obviously, these neural net, deep neural networks are related to the amount of data that you have. If you don't have enough data, you cannot talk about deep neural networks. You have to, to stay with shallow networks, shallow neural networks. Uh, but now with the, the increasingly amount of data that becomes available everywhere, uh, this is now a possibility. And in addition to that, obviously, with the high performance computing, you can do things that 50 years ago or maybe even 10 years ago was not possible. So back to the, the problem that, that I was going to talk today. Uh, what I want to do is uh, I have uh, seismic data, which you can see here. Sometimes you have a 3D, 3D cube, or sometimes you have only slices of, of this data, and you have uh, well log information. So here you have uh, land, land seismic acquisition or marine seismic acquisition, and the, the well log is only at one place of, 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 this, of this seismic cube. Uh, if you are lucky, you may have lots of wells, but in practice, uh, you don't have many wells, you have few of them. And what I want to do is, uh, I, I have the very precise information in the well log. I have uh, samples at every 15 centimeters. And I want to extrapolate this information to a seismic scale. And to do that, I will use the, the artificial neural networks, the, the yeah, the shallow shallow neural networks. I will explain why. I have a. This is the. This is one of my my seismic slices. Imagine that you make a cut here and and you take a, a part of this. And I have one slice of uh, my seismic data. What what are, what is this? This is uh, the amplitude. So uh, you have here around nine nine hundred traces which are 900 geophones that record uh, some data when some sources, for example, uh, guns explode. Uh, so this is the amplitude and, and, and here is the scale for the amplitude of the traces. 
Uh, and with this, uh, with this uh, seismic data, what interpreters do is they, they can see faults. For example, here you have some faults. And, and also they can, they can see where the formations or the main formations, the layers that are of interest are located. Uh, so you have here in this case, you have in intercalations of sands and, and shales. Sands are, have higher porosity and shales have uh, uh, less porosity, less permeability. And in this, in this case, in the well, uh, this well produced uh, uh, oil in, in, in some of the sands of uh, this MB are for Mugrosa is the, is the zone or the, the layer of interest is called Mugrosa. Uh, so the Mugrosa uh, sands and shells, they, they have an intercalation of sands and shells. And in the Mugrosa area, the, the, the well, this well produced some oil. Um, this is from, from an oil field in Colombia. I, I didn't want to talk much about about the about the about the set because uh, I don't have much time. Uh, I we have three wells. I will I will I will in the in this in this seismic section that I will show today. I have only one well, uh, but in the field I have I have a cube and I have three wells. This information that you see here is the information that the the well log has. Uh, it's every 15 centimeters, and you have velocities, you have velocities with P wave velocity, you have densities, you have uh, volume of clay and sand. So, for example, here the interpreter made uh, a plot with yellows and, and, and browns. The yellows are sands, and the browns are shales. And then you have also uh, porosity estimation, uh, water saturation. Uh, so what you want is basically to extrapolate the information at the well log here uh, to the seismic scale. So I have, I, I have only in one place my information for all these petrophysical parameters, and I want to extrapolate it to the whole seismic area. Uh, so uh, I use this, this well, as I said, in the seismic section. I have one well, and, and here, for example, you have the spontaneous um, parameter. Uh, the faces are sands of shells, yellow are sands, brown are shells, and these are these come from the interpretation of the well logs. The well logs, for example, the volume of clay here. So in this yellow area, you see there's a sand or a shell, sand, shell, sand, shell. And here is the, the water saturation and the porosity and the, the in, in, in green, uh, you have here in green, the areas where the well produced some oil. So if you see, this is the this is the, the whole well, and I am only looking at this bit, this bit because here is the part where the, the oil produce the well produce oil. So I uh, will in order to do that, I will combine seismic attributes so with the oil with the well log information. And the seismic attributes are only the functions, mathematical functions of these seismic traces. So you have like uh, instantaneous uh, attributes like instantaneous frequency or Hilbert transform or derivative of the seismic trace or envelope or other mathematical functions that you can um, compute. And they, they represent a thin, bend, thin bed indicator. They represent some properties, some physical properties that you want to enhance in the image. So I have only one. I have only one well, but the well has one trace here, which is close. To, and there's one seismic trace close to the well, and with this seismic trace, I will have some mathematical functions. Uh, so the seismic uh, trace and the seismic attributes will be my inputs to my ne neural network, and the output will be uh, any of the of any of the well log information, any of these curves, like the volume of clay, like the velocity of P wave, the density, the porosity. Uh, so I will do, I have to do something that is called upscaling. And the upscaling means that I have to remove some of the points in the, in the well log because I have information here every 15 centimeters. And in the seismic, I have information that varies depending on the, on the, on the area but maybe 10, 10 meters, maybe 60 meters, depending on the area that the, the seismic crosses. 
So I have to do a, a rescaling to make compatible the information of the well log with the seismic information. So I will have to throw my many, many data points, but I don't have more information in the seismic, so I have to reconcile these two scales. So and from the seismic section, I create seismic attributes. As I said, the, the inputs for the neural network will be only the seismic trace and the seismic attribute for, the, for that location. And the, and the output will be the porosity or the density or the velocity, the P-weight velocity or the, uh, or the bueno, permeability, you know, about volume of clay. And, and once I have my neural network trained, I could apply the network to the whole section or to the whole cube, seismic cube. And I will obtain uh, sections of the different properties. And I have to select what, what, what seismic attributes do I need. So I use something that is called the gamma test. And the gamma test, what it does is, uh, before I train any neural network, I spend time training, I will uh, select the best inputs. And for example, in this case, if I think on this function, only think about this semi-cylinder, uh, and, and I have some data here. And I, I would like to predict the, the function, which is the cylinder, which, which is a function of two variables. And I want to know which variable is most important for this function. So I put this in my gamma test and I take that the, the, the best in, uh, combination of inputs is only taking the X variable because X is where the function varies. And no matter where I move here, the, 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 the function is defined by the X. So this is the best combination where my gamma statistic is the lowest. And then the second is only take Y and the worst is to take both. Uh, if I change a little bit the scenario and I have man, a cone rather than a cylinder, uh, I also have only the half of, of the cone. Uh, and the best, uh, the best combination will be to take both X and Y variables. So this is a very simple toy example, but uh, uh, it, here we, I have very much complex that I cannot plot the function because I have more variables. Uh, but that's the idea to, to, to see what, what is, which is the best combination of seismic attributes. Once I, I, uh, I have, there are other options for that. I use always, always the gamma test because it's something that my PhD supervisor developed a long time ago. Uh, but there are other, other approaches or there are other uh, techniques such as this one, uh, but I will not talk about this today. Uh, the, the, once I, I run my gamma test, for example, for, for the velocity, P-wave velocity, I have this is my best combination of seismic attributes, attenuation, sweetness, structural azimuth, envelope, chaos, deep de deviation, deep illumination. For volume of clay, I have a different set of attributes, density, another set of attributes, and, and, and basically, is uh, you have to think this about in terms of you have a data point in, in the input space that is similar to another B data point in the input space. In the output space, the, 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 the output space should be similar as, as well. Because if you, don't have, uh, if you don't have that, then you don't have enough inputs to define the porosity or the, the parameter that you want to estimate. That's the, 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 the the idea behind that. Uh, so having said that, I trained for, for, for volume of clay and I've obtained this, this section after I apply my neural network that was for, 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 one, for one seismic trace and the attributes and, and the volume of clay. And then I applied the neural network to the whole section. And I saw that there's a very remarkable layer structure. So I thought, well, if I, if I take only the, the two classes, once with 0.5 greater than 0.5 and the, the other lower than 0.5. So if, if, the, if, the, if the data is greater than 0.5, that means that it has a lot of water. So that's a shale. And, and if it's less than 0.5, then there's a sand. So I obtained this. Also had the interpretation for that. And uh, I do the same. Well, I, I also identified the, the sands and shells in the formation, on Murasa formation here. And they, they, they are well located uh, in, the, in the estimation. So I do the same for, 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 the, for the density, for the velocities. I'm sorry that I go fast, but I, I'm running out of time. Uh, porosities. 
Uh, and then I, I, I also can switch the sands or shells because I know where the sands and where the shells are. And I, for example, here in this example, I, I draw the shells in white and only uh, plot the, 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 the porosity for sands. And here the same, I only plot the porosity for shells. And I can do the same for water saturation. I have water saturation that comes from the well log and I train, I did the same thing. Uh, and I can also turn on the, 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 the water saturation for sands or for shales. Um, and all these, oh, sorry, this, uh, this code, something went wrong. Oh, I know, I'm, I apologize for this. Anyway, I have, uh, I can also do uh, uh, hydrocarbon estimation from, from water saturation. And, and this is just a, a small, small example of, uh, I also do uh, unsupervised neural network and I can, I can, I can uh, choose uh, unsupervised and do self-organizing maps for choosing, for, for choosing uh, facies, so sands or shells or limestones. And the neural network is a retina like that. And then the retina, the data converts to, uh, to uh, classes in the seismic when you back to the seismic. Uh, so you have things like this. Uh, in, in this case, you have sands, shells, and limestones. And in this case, only the sands and shells that I have shown you before. Um, so quickly go to the, to the conclusions. Uh, the artificial neural networks allow me to do a, an extrapolation of the parameters that I have only on, at, 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 uh, at the well log scale. And I could do uh, deep learning and, uh, and I can do high performance computing if I have more data, the data is essential to do. And I do the analysis for the gamma test and the, this, this gamma test allowed me to know uh, wh which are the best uh, parameters for the neural network, the input parameters. And I also can do some supervised and non-supervised neural networks. And, and this uh, is important to say that these results can be used for, for full waveform inversion as input parameters for, for the initial models. And uh, we have the path for, for the 3D seismic cubes. Um, Thank you very much for information. Here's my email in case you want to send me an email. Uh, I would like to thank you all for, for, for listening today. Thank you, Jose Maria. Okay. Thank you very much, Ursula. And um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is that uh, today um, uh, machine learning is very popular, but one of the critics uh, for machine learning is about the analysis of the errors. Uh, because in other numerical methods, uh, when we have uh, analytical equations, it's relative, relative easy to establish what, uh, what, what is the level of error that we make respect to the physical reality. However, till today, usually uh, machine, learner, machine learning methodologies don't produce these typical bar errors. So my question is, uh, do you think that there is some advance on, on this aspect or is something that uh, we cannot expect uh, this kind of analysis in the next future? Well, yes, I, I think that you're quite right. And, and I, I think that we can expect something in this, in this, in this, in this regard. Uh, for example, I, I was just thinking about quick and what they call quick and dirty, which is, train a thousand neural networks and then and then try to to produce a bar of uh, you know more or less where is the the right answer and then uh, try to produce a bar for the estimation uh, but you need to train a lot of neural networks and see how robust they are uh, so i think that the way will be something like that or or also this monte carlo chain thing um, there are also uh, lots of methods to do, for example, avoid overfitting because sometimes your neural network is, your results seem to be very okay, but when you apply the, the neural network to unseen data, um, the, the neural network does not respond or, or you don't know if it's doing good or not because it's overtrained or overfit. Uh, so there, there are some techniques now that they call dropout so you have a deep neural network, so that means that you have a lot of, of data points. 
and you are able to remove some of the of the neurons in the neural network and see how how the neural network performs or how robust the neural network is. But yes, I think that the 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 way to do that would be to to train thousands of neural networks on one problem and trying to assess or to 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 draw a bar of uh, an error of the minimum and maximum of the the uncertainty. Thank you. And another question: uh, When you use neural networks for geophysical information, uh, you are working in single precision or in double precision? In double precision, double precision. Yes, uh -huh. uh, all, all of these have uh, double precision. Yes. In fact, for example, for for the for the gamma test, you need high precision. Uh, the gamma test will not work for for categorical data. You need high. Uh, um, double precision. Okay, so thank you very much again, Ursula. Much. And we are moving forward to the next uh, speaker. So next speaker is uh, Roman Grossier. He is a mechanical engineer and he has a PhD degree in computational geophysics from the uh, University of Nice in France. He has uh, worked in the SaySCOP project from 2006 to 2009, and mainly in 2D elastic modeling and inversion uh, of seismic uh, wave waves. He has moved in 2010 to Grenoble as postdoc and worked in full waveform inversion for near surface uh, problems. In 2011, he got an assistant professor position at the University of Grenoble. And uh, he has participated uh, in, uh, in different, um, pro different uh, projects and problems related with the SaySCOPE project from 2013 to 2016. Uh, now he is the PI of the SaySCOPE project. So thank you very much uh, for your talk, uh, Romain, and you can start uh, when you want. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, so today I uh, would like to present you uh, some work we did uh, uh, related to full waveform inversion. So it directly goes in, uh, in the following of what uh, Joseph presented before. Um, I will particularly uh, focus on uh, some uh, physical limitation we have uh, from the wave physics itself when we are dealing with uh, reflected waves uh, and how to, uh, to handle uh, such kind of uh, limitation. So this work has been done in the, in the frame of SaySCOP uh, consortium uh, and uh, also uh, take benefit from the Enercico project. Um, so I will uh, go briefly through an introduction to present uh, uh, full waveform inversion, how it works, uh, and what uh, are some uh, physical uh, assumptions behind, and then how to manage reflected wave in uh, such kind of uh, algorithm and what are the different problem and solution we can have uh, with such kind of algorithm. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, as uh, have been uh, presented before by Joseph, uh, the motivation behind the use of the full waveform in the tomography workflow is mainly driven by resolution. So uh, you can see here some 3D views in a, a crystal target uh, obtained by, I would say, conventional reflection tomography, so travel time tomography of reflected wave. And you can see here the same uh, sections, same uh, view with full waveform inversion, despite the fact that here the inversion is only performed until 10 hertz. So we can see that the uh, resolution gain obtained by considering the full waveform information is quite impressive and allows to uh, interpret uh, geologically 
some uh, features as some uh, thin layers, some low velocity anomalies that can be associated to gas, uh, some thin structures that can be related to fractures uh, at different locations in this 3D view. And we can also see the same kind of geological pattern on horizontal and vertical sections. So this is the main motivation behind full waveform inversion to be able to have quantitative uh, uh, model of uh, physical parameters of the subsurface for an easy and uh, uh, I would say um, a straightforward uh, interpretation of the results. So the inversion workflow is as follows. Uh, so usually we start from an unknown uh, real earth from which we have seismic measurement. We start from an initial model in which we are doing the forward problem, the main HPC intensive part of the whole workflow as stated by Josep. This forward problem allows to compute some uh, synthetic version of the observation. And then we want to minimize the distance between those synthetic data and the observation. And to do that, we are solving an inverse problem, which will iteratively update the model to minimize the, uh, mit the mismatch between observation and uh, uh, synthetic data until convergence toward a model which hopefully represents the subsurface. So this is the workflow of the usual formulation of FWI as proposed in the 80s. Of course, since that time, we have evolved a lot on the dimension. We went from 2D to 3D. Uh, we went from uh, acoustic to uh, 3D viscoelastic. Uh, but still, there are many uh, issues related to this kind of technologies. Uh, and um, one issue is, in fact, intrinsically related to physics. So I will explain you now what are these kind of issues by showing you how we compute the uh, perturbation direction of the FWI, which is related to the gradient, so the first derivative of this misfit function, which gives us the direction to go to update our model. So in practice on the field, we are injecting some energy from a source. Here, it's a toy example to understand the, the, the way it works. So we have one source here, one receiver. The background is homogeneous with a reflector. We inject the energy from the source. We have some propagation of wave into the subsurface with a direct wave. The direct wave is impacting the reflector, which creates a reflected wave. And at the receiver position, we are recording one direct wave and one reflected wave. This is our observation we have in hand to start inversion. What we need to do to compute the gradient of the uh, FWI problem is to inject this, uh, in fact, the um, a signal at the receivers how to do that, we first mimic what happened on the field in the computer. So we start from an initial guess of the subsurface. We assume we know the position of the source and the receiver. Up to now, we assume we know the source wavelet, and we inject numerically the energy at the source position. In our prior model, we have no information about the reflector, and we have a wrong velocity compared to the reality. So we are able to simulate a direct wave field, which is recorded at the receiver position, which gives us this red seismogram here. And the uh, theory tells us that to compute the gradient, we need to inject the residue, so the difference between the black and the red uh, seismogram here, and we need to inject this residue from the receiver position and backward in time. And at the same time, we are computing this uh, back propagating wave field here. So to compute this lambda that will appear, we will do a product with the incident field we already computed once. So what's happened in the computer? We are propagating this uh, back propagating uh, wave field from the receivers. 
backward in time. At the beginning, we have this reflected wave residue which propagate into the subsurface, numerical subsurface. Later on, the beginning of the direct wave residue here, which propagate. And we can see that on the right panel, we accumulate the uh, instantaneous product between this U field and this lambda field. And at the end of the propagation, we end up with this nice uh, kernel view here, which tells us a lot about the physics and assumption behind FWI. First, we have one uh, pattern here, which directly connects the source to the receiver, which is uh, what we call the first Fresnel zone. This first Fresnel zone tells us how to modify the velocity model such that the, res the direct residue could be minimized. Due to finite frequency effect, we can put some uh, positive or negative velocity, depending if we are in the red or blue part, to minimize this residue. This residue is associated here to uh, what we could call a smooth or low wave number component kernel uh, from the source to the receiver. The reflected wave residue, which was here, uh, is associated to this other part of the kernel, which appears as a migration isochrone. So Joseph was speaking previously uh, about reverse time migration. This is really the, the regime, the reflected wave is playing here as a migration isochrone, and especially it contains high wave number. It does not contain any low wave number. So that means that uh, depending where we are in space, what kind of wave travel into the subsurface, the wave number component of the gradient will be different. The transmitted wave will uh, play mostly on smooth component, while reflection and diffraction will play more on high wave number components, so details. So what does that mean in a realistic uh, scenario of crystal exploration? Uh, we have these two uh, components from the source and the receiver wave field. And uh, this gradient can be seen as a product of the two wave field at each spatial location. And as I just said previously, depending if we are in a transmission regime, so with a large theta angle here, or a, a reflection regime with a small theta angle here, the uh, value of the wave number component of the gradient will change. And uh, we can do a small analytical analysis based on plane wave just to understand how it works. And this analytical uh, uh, analysis tells us that large theta, so transmission give us low k, smooth component, and uh, small theta will give us high k, so details. And this is the principle behind diffraction tomography, which is uh, used in full waveform inversion. So that means that if we consider a crystal target with a, with a sorry, surface acquisition at shallow, we will be able to sample both large scattering angle with diving and transmitted wave and small scattering angle through reflection and short offset uh, diffraction. Which means that at shallow, we are uh, sampling a large and a, a broad range of diffracting angle, which give us a broad range of wave number component update in this region. At depth, we are only able to sample small theta angle, which means that we will have only high wave number component at depth. What's happened if we launch inversion like that? I will show you an example here based on the 2D synthetic case, but the principle is the same for any uh, 3D and more complex cases. We consider a streamer acquisition on this uh, uh, target here, which is composed of sediment, a reservoir, and some uh, lower velocity anomalies here, which represent gas. 
if we consider um, this data set and we launch a classical FWI, which means we take this whole data set as observation, we end up with this middle model, which uh, look like a kind of a crap. In fact, if we analyze more in detail, the shallow part is relatively accurate because at shallow, we are able to sample both shallow diving wave and shallow reflection. But as soon as we go deeper than one to 1.5 kilometer depth with uh, limited offset data, we are just able to add high wave number component to the smooth initial model, but we are completely lacking uh, low wave number component and middle wave number component. So this is an intrinsic limitation to FWI where we don't have a sampling uh, of a large diffracting angle. So we don't have sampling of transmission at depth. So how to uh, handle that? One idea could be to rely on reflectivity. In other words, to uh, assume we are able to localize some reflectivity reflectors. And uh, based on this assumed reflectivity, exploit the transmission path along the reflected wave path. The idea is therefore at depth to exploit both small diffracting angles through reflection, but also large diffracting angle thanks to transmitted path along reflected wave path. The idea behind that is to rely on scale separation between the low wave number component of velocity and high wave number component of reflectivity. So this uh, technique is in fact a kind of adaptation of what was proposed in the 80s as migration-based travel time tomography, which makes the assumption of scale separation between smooth uh, background velocity and high wave number perturbation. When uh, we do this explicit separation in the FWI workflow, uh, we can focus on reflected and uh, diffracted wave uh, only in the misfit function. And when we do that, we are able to build the um, uh, reflection waveform inversion gradient as a sum of two terms which appears as a kind of rabbit here, kernel here, which is nothing else than a transmitted first Fresnel zone along the reflected path, the reflected path being possible thanks to an assumption of reflectivity, which create reflected wave in the data. In terms of uh, uh, HPC and computational cost, we are doubling the cost of uh, uh, wave propagation because instead of one uh, incident field and one adjoint field, we now have two incident and two uh, equivalent adjoint field in this formulation. But we are able to exploit reflected wave. Um, based on this idea, with a PhD student, a few years ago, we have tried to combine the information of transmitted wave and reflected wave in what we have called joint full waveform inversion. In such a case, the misfit function is split in two parts, one diving wave term in the smooth background and one reflected waveform inversion term in the uh, smooth background plus uh, prior assumption about reflectivity. In such a case, we are able to combine this uh, smooth direct wave component of the kernel, this smooth reflected wave component of the kernel without the migration isochrone, which bring only high wave number component. So in terms of workflow, how it works, if we uh, go back to our synthetic case, here is the true reflectivity, so true impedance, in fact, in such a case, the true uh, macro velocity model, so the smooth velocity. To build our uh, subsurface model, we need to cycle over first an estimation of the reflectivity in the uh, background velocity. So at the beginning, very smooth one. 
And based on this uh, assumed reflectivity, we are building some update of velocity. Updating this velocity, we can re-estimate the reflectivity. Assuming this reflectivity, we can re-update the velocity, and so on and so forth, through a, cycle, uh, a cyclic workflow, where we progressively inject low wave number component of the velocity, and each time repositioning the reflectors in the reflectivity uh, step. So the workflow is quite expensive because this reflectivity estimation is almost equivalent to a, a least square uh, reverse time migration. And based on that, we can update the velocity. So the workflow is quite expensive, but allows to exploit a reflected wave. Here, I just compare the interest of uh, putting the direct wave and diving wave in addition to reflection. So we obtain here this model for impedance and velocity compared to this one if we consider only reflected wave. No surprise here, diving and direct wave allows to better constrain the shallow, which then translate to better estimation at depth. So based on that, we are able to see that uh, through an explicit scale separation, we can have some workflows to update the low wave number component of the velocity at depth that are not sampled by diving wave. It relies on an alternated workflow of reflectivity and impedance, which is an almost linear inversion, but quite expensive, and followed by a smooth velocity update, which is non-linear and also quite expensive. So there is an interest in, you in combining reflected wave and direct wave, as I just said, and uh, the uh, limitation of such kind of approach uh, or related to first the cycle skipping, which is not avoided by this scheme. Uh, so I will discuss that just after. And the overall computational cost because of this cyclic workflow. So I will briefly show you now how we have been able to kind of mitigate these two limitations recently. The first one related to cycle skipping has been handled by uh, graph space optimal transport. So this is a way to measure the misfit between data. Usually, FWI rely on the difference between observed and calculated data, which is sensitive to cycle skipping. And recently, uh, several groups uh, have proposed to use optimal transport uh, measure between the calculated and observed data, which does not rely on the point-to-point -point difference, but on a global mapping between calculated to observed data. And one good property of this optimal transport distance is that it is convex with respect to uh, time shift uh, of uh, a given pattern. So one uh, formulation of this uh, graph space of this uh, uh, optimal transport distance is a graph space optimal transport that we have proposed in our group, which allows to have an assignment between observed, that would be the all these blue points here with the uh, calculated, calculated data, which would be all these red points here. And this assignment can be done both in amplitude and in time, which allows to handle uh, the cycle skipping. There is no more limitation of half a period in the measure of the misfit. I do not go too much into the detail uh, today about this measure. And I will show you how, uh, thanks to this um, misfit function, we are able to mitigate cycle skipping effect. So here again, the same case study um, with the uh, synthetic data in the initial model, the true velocity model. Uh, here is the workflow we are using. So we build impedance or reflectivity by a nonlinear inversion. And then based on that, we update for velocity. And as you can see, we are cycling 10 times here over this whole workflow. To build impedance, we rely on short offset reflection. And then here are the separation between reflected wave and uh, direct wave for the velocity update. You can see here the uh, obtained result for velocity with the graph space optimal transport compared to the one with L2 base or so difference based misfit function. And the associated uh, data fit, and you can see how the uh, mismatch 
at long offset on direct wave has not been able to be uh, handled by L2 based misfit, while the mismatch is much better with graph space optimal transport. Thanks to this uh, uh, particular way of measuring the distance between data. Of course, this uh, improved velocity allows to have much better estimation of impedance, as you can see here uh, on this section and on the uh, vertical um, uh, uh, 1D profile on top. I will finish now on the computational cost and how to mitigate the cost of this cycled uh, workflow. And to do that, we have uh, relied on a pseudo time formulation. The idea is to rely on a seismic invariant, which is a T0, which is the arrival time of event at zero offset. It is true in 1D media, it's no more true as soon as we are 3D, but most of the target could be at least assumed uh, to rely on this invariant, even if we can reestimate it uh, regularly. And the idea is therefore to no more estimate the impedance in the depth domain, but in the pseudo time domain, thanks to a chain rule transformation between depth and time, assuming a 1D propagation. The idea is therefore to uh, remove the cycle workflow and just computing the reflectivity once in this pseudo time domain, and then each time the velocity will move, the um, reflectivity will automatically be mapped accordingly in the depth domain, thanks to the uh, T0 invariant. So I show you the same application again uh, with this uh, approach compared to the depth domain. So here is the result we can obtain in the depth domain. Um, but uh, no, uh, uh, I would say, uh, tricky weighting approach uh, of weighting uh, with, again, the optimal transport, but, uh, and uh, no, uh, no cycling. So we can see here the result uh, of the depth domain inversion compared to the uh, pseudo time domain inversion. So in terms of data fit, it's very close, but in terms of, uh, uh, I would say depth domain uh, velocity, we can see the improvement as you can see here. And in this workflow, we have decreased by 10 the computational cost because we are doing a single loop and not 10 loops as done previously. And you can see here how the impedance is moving, I would say, automatically as soon as the velocity is updated uh, in the workflow. So to conclude, uh, in this presentation, I try to, to show you how the physics uh, itself is limiting our imaging capacity at depth, uh, even if we have, uh, I would say, a big cluster to perform FWI. So to be able to handle the problem, we need to sometimes to reformulate the problem itself. So this is what is done in reflection waveform inversion and joint full waveform inversion in which we are able to update the low wave number component of velocity through scale separation and reformulation of the, of the problem. It relies usually on an alternated workflow between reflectivity and smooth velocity component. Uh, I show you how uh, considering direct and diving wave allows to complement the information provided by reflection in such a workflow and how robust uh, optimal transport-based misfit function allows to mitigate cycle skipping effect, and how reformulating the problem in a pseudo-time domain allows to decrease the overall computational cost and to a simplification of the workflow. I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank the Enerxico uh, project for funding and Sayscope project also for funding uh, mainly PhD and postdoc uh, position in our group to manage uh, such kind of research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Romain, for your talk. Very interesting. 
And there is a question of uh, somebody in the public uh, in a previous talk about the numerical approach used to solve all these wave equations. And uh, typically in the industry, the approach is using finite differences. Mm -hmm. I think uh, your group use mainly uh, spectral elements. Maybe you can comment about what, what do you think are the main benefits of uh, this different approach? So um, the work I presented today is mostly based on finite difference. In fact, uh, in, uh, for most acoustic work in our group, we rely on uh, finite difference. Uh, and for most of elastic work, we rely on finite element, mostly to handle uh, free surface, topographies, complex bathymetries, and so on. So I would say that uh, to me, there is no uh, best approach than another. Uh, it's mostly driven by uh, application and requirement to well reproduce uh, the physics and the complexity of the target. So it's true that most of application, most of uh, method used in the industry is a finite difference. Uh, but I do not, but most of industry are acoustic and I do not know for elastic if uh, really there is one approach better than the, another. Okay, so there is no more questions. We are stopping here the talks. And so thank you again, Romain, for your, for your talk. And we are moving to the round table that I think is Yusef who, who is going to moderate the round table. So I give uh, you the, I pass you the, the, the voice. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much and thank uh, all speakers for uh, for their presentations. I mean, I think we, we've done different aspects of it. Which are relevant, let's say, for subsurface exploration, uh, more specifically, let's say, for the oil and gas industry. And I think they're, they're all very, very interesting for, say, for the purposes of the growth of the net critical project. Okay, so let's let's start with this uh, with the second part of uh, of today's event. Okay, so uh, just first of all, let me uh, give you a reminder that you will receive a survey from uh, from Mireya in, in some time, probably through the chat. If you are kindly can access it and, and fill it, uh, we would really appreciate that. I mean, that's information which is relevant for, for all of us. Then, uh, very briefly, this roundtable will include uh, what well, the, the speakers that uh, have already presented uh, today, the talks, uh, Ursula and, and Romain, of course, you're, you're very welcome to participate in this uh, roundtable. Also, Maria Tella uh, has been uh, let's say, directing the, this, uh, this, uh, let's say this event up to now. So just very briefly, uh, for those who don't know him in detail, I mean, he's a doctor in telecommunications engineer. He is uh, also a professor at the university, at the Technical University of Catalonia, uh, UPC. And, uh, well, he has a long experience in R&D projects, uh, has participated in several, more than 100 uh, articles, and has been uh, the key founding element, let's say, in the Repsol BSC Joint Research Center, which has been, let's say, alive for quite some years. At BSC and has many other research activities related to energy, uh, fusion energy, uh, renewable energy. So uh, this is a, a very, let's say, uh, capable um, speaker for today's uh, roundtable. And also we have with us uh, Tofik Latayer. I don't know if he, if he can. Uh, he's already with us. Yes, he's, he's, uh, I, I can see him out there. Who is uh, working at uh, Repsol, uh, specifically at the Repsol Technology Lab. Uh, he manages the subsurface technology products uh, at the company, which includes several things like computational geoscience, geophysics, uh, geology, geomechanics, and, and other aspects. Uh, has previous experience in, in, in funding and managing uh, earth physician sciences, uh, and also has had a managing role in Emerson Paradigm, also as an advisor at Saudi Aramco, and uh, also for, let's say, the management of uh, the, the geosciences portfolio. At the Gulf of Mexico in, in Repsol. So he's, a, as, as, as far as I remember, he's a master's in geoscience, PhD in computer science at Nancy School, and also holds a, a, a master's degree in business administration uh, at the HEC Business School in France. So welcome to Fit as well. So the idea right now would be, and I have a few questions and I would like them to be answered by, by, by 
by you. So I might uh, lead the question first to one of you, and I might, uh, if, if you are happy to contribute or you have some so, say some particular thoughts, anybody in the roundtable, please do that. Please just uh, no, uh, intervene uh, freely. Otherwise, I will uh, keep let's say asking uh, some of you for your let's say for whether you agree or not with what your colleagues have uh, have said, or you have any uh, additional questions. So I, I may start with uh, with the the, 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 the newcomer uh, to pick if you don't mind. I mean, I, I would start to I would like to start uh, to, to pose you uh, the first question, which would be what what you think has been uh, in, in your opinion the impact of, of HPC of supercomputing in the geophysical exploration uh, world in the last ten years. What's what's your experience? What what do you think about that? Yeah, first of all, th thanks uh, thanks uh, Joseph and for for having me here and. Uh, it was great, great presentations. Uh, thank you also for uh, for for the presenters. Uh, I mean, while we're talking and uh, preparing for, for this uh, round table, uh, I did some research and uh, found that uh, surprisingly, in some areas and uh, based on some analysis from service companies, there is eighty percent of seismic data that is not processed yet, and this is really huge. So imagine the amount of money that was spent there. And the reason is the tools, the algorithms are not here to, to, uh, to, uh, to process those kind of data. And with the, the, uh, the market conditions right now, uh, it's unbelievable to, to go and spend some time to go and process them. Unless, and unless we have this uh, HPC, comp uh, HPC capabilities. Uh, and uh, it was really clear to, to everybody we're talking to, not only from service companies or research uh, and the institutes like BEC or academia, or oil companies uh, that they said the HPC will be a big contributor to get this kind of information, get this processing of the data using some of the te techniques that were presented today, and uh, get uh, additional information without the need to go and acquire seismic da additional data, which is really very, very important. And I think you mentioned that, that the reduction of the cost uh, to balance uh, the, I mean, the use of HPC to reduce the cost and the balance, the, the acquisition, it's really very, very important. I think you mentioned that in the beginning. And also the, the other thing that uh, we, uh, we see from, uh, from Repsol's side is this uh, quantification of uh, uncertainties. Uh, again, the, the normal workflow of a geoscientist so far is to go and to study the data and try to fine tune all the parameters in order not to spend a lot of time on the computation because there is a lack of horsepower, computation horsepower. With the HPC capabilities, the, the role of the geoscientist will move to, I mean, let's try to run multiple scenarios, uh, assess all the parameters. And my job as geoscientist is to go and select among those scenarios, which one will be realistic. And in that case, I will uh, try to mitigate any risk that will be taken, but not taking into account this uncertainty. So this is really very, very important. And that's what we call inside Rector is go, going from single model uh, assessment to kind of screening the different scenarios that are all plus or minus, I mean, more or less realistic, but to be able to identify. And this is really very, very key we're seeing in the, in the HPC, the horsepower competition, but also changing the role of the geoscientists in spending more time thinking and screening the different assets. So this is really in the nutshell, the, the, the changes we're seeing in, uh, by the introduction of HPC in, in the area of oil and gas. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, actually, very striking figure is eighty percent of let's say of unused data. That's 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 quite quite a significant number. Quite quite scary, I might say also. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I I think I, I might also uh, uh, call upon uh, Jose Maria. I mean, he has been uh, let's say uh, leading several projects, of course, tightly connected in HPC and 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 geophysics. And maybe maybe he can also tell us what what's uh, what's your opinion and and uh, let's say what 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 do you think has been the role of HPC for? Geophysics in, yeah. the, in the last decade. For me, it's clear that HPC is a critical technology for for oil and gas industry. Without uh, the growth in, in capacity of HPC systems, we cannot uh, use techniques like like uh, full waveform inversion or just the reverse time migration. This was possible when teraflop computers appear. Previously to this, I remember the, the people normally do Kirchhoff migration using the array approximation instead of the waves that clearly 
is not enough for complex uh, geophysical scenarios where you have uh, subsold oil, etc. So HPC is a driver technology for oil and gas industry in for sure in the last decade. Uh, and in the next future, I, I think that this will be continue because we have not finished yet. Uh, com this, this technology is not totally mature. There are some things to, to be improved. Okay? And in the other way, the fact that this technology is uh, so useful for this important industry makes uh, uh, put a, a, a strong uh, push in the HPC industry to improve the systems. They have a lot of sales, a lot of money uh, be, uh, between moving between uh, oil and gas companies and uh, uh, computer uh, builders. So yes, uh, supercomputing is clearly uh, a key technology for, for oil and gas. Okay, that, that's, that also kind of raises the question. I mean, um, so, so we know that has, let's say, played a, a huge role in the past and, and, and computers will become definitely faster. So, I mean, I would like to ask, for example, uh, uh, Romain, what, so what, what do you think? I mean, where do we spend, let's say, uh, the, the extra compute power that will be available in the, in, the, in the next years? I mean, think about, let's say, five years from now, uh, things like this, I mean, bigger computers, more resources. What do we do with them? I and mean, well, how, how do you see the future, let's say, of geophysical imaging with those resources available? To me, um, I, I think that um, the, the, the key, uh, the, the, the key point currently related to FWI is to be able to go to higher frequency with better physics. Uh, we have seen uh, impressive application of uh, high frequency FWI in the few past years, uh, which allows, uh, which should allow to go toward a directly interpretable image of the subsurface almost without uh, later migration. So uh, I think that there is a, a key uh, point here, uh, but uh, which should be uh, strongly supported by the interpreters part of the industry uh, that needs to be uh, learned to that and uh, to uh, be able to work directly on uh, high resolution quantitative uh, models provided by uh, FWI-like technology, which should provide multi-parameter uh, output to be interpreted then at the, almost down to the reservoir scale. And uh, there are some uh, clear um, uh, yeah, evidence that such kind of uh, approach could be feasible, but that's really uh, challenging on the HPC part. And that could uh, remove some assumptions that we usually do uh, when we go from velocity to migration, because we would have a single model to interpret with all the wave number inside. Yeah, this is one of the, one of the most, uh, let's say, disturbing concepts of geophysics, right? I mean, like, like trying to separate the subsurface in two things, which are kind of intertwined and, and kind of conceptually, we're always playing on two different scales. Which could be even three if we try to look at, let's say, at the, at the scale of the well logs, right? I mean, like, like yeah, this is, sure. uh, today with with, uh, with Ursula, I mean, there's multiple scales of complexity, let's say, interplaying there, and we there's always the option of separate, conquer, and divide, which is what we're doing at the moment. But probably there's a time also for integration, which uh, which we'll see in, in the future. So, which which maybe leads me to to Ursula in this case. I mean, you, you have given us as a, a very interesting uh, summary of what can be done, let's say, with uh, with uh, with uh, neural networks and in this case, uh, machine learning uh, techniques, in order to integrate this information, which is the scale which we typically, I mean, from the HPC imaging part, I mean, we tend to ignore or we use that only as a validator, let's say, for, for our, let's say, approaches. But you're very much doing the opposite. I mean, using that information as, let's say, as the source for everything else. I mean, you're trying to, let's say, to spread out the information from, let's say, wells to everywhere, let's say, in your domain by using attributes and, and, and so on. So, I mean, I, as far as I see it, I'm, or, or at least the, the, the way I'm, I'm, I'm seeing these technologies, they, they kind of live uh, still, each of them in their niche. I mean, kind of uh, no machine learning tools and then these high definition things kind of live in, in one part of the, say, the geophysical community. 
imaging and 3D models and, and such live in another one. So Ursula, do you think there's hope for, let's say, for a, for a full integration of all of that, let's say, in the future? Is that one of the goals that we wanna, we're going to see? Yes, I, I think that's the aim or the goal uh, to integrate both worlds. Uh, so far, they, they, they have like running a bit apart from each other. Uh, but today, big data applications are expected to move towards more computer intensive uh, algorithms for descriptive and predictive analysis. And well, machine learning and deep learning uh, offer novel ways to extract hidden knowledge and uh, to perform dimension reduction or detect uh, events of interest. And, and also, I think that uh, there's a need to, you know, the, the high performance computing is, uh, well, uh, sometimes uh, the learning curve is uh, steep. So uh, there are many efforts in, for example, TensorFlow and these applications, they are trying to somehow bridge the, the, the gap between the learning curve and, and the real application. So it takes a long, long time for people to, to learn how to program in, you know, GPUs, for example, and tomorrow GPUs will not be longer used or not in the same way. Or, and also the, 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 the problem that I see is how to, as, as we, as we when, when, when we program GPUs, uh, we, we have the problem of managing the memory locations and how, how can we speed this process? When we have a big data, like a huge amount of data, we also need to solve this problem and how, how to manage this big data and how to manage the memory of the devices that we are using and how to uh, be quick in learning the, 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 the new uh, algorithms and, and, and new environments for programming these devices. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a big challenge in, in, that, in that part. But obviously uh, the aim of uh, artificial intelligence or now that is called super artificial, uh, super intelligence or general artificial intelligence, which is more like like produce a, 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 an intelligent device with self-conscious or I don't know, <laughs> you can imagine whatever a science fiction uh, novel can can tell you. Uh, so uh, I think that the the the, the gap or, or the gap that we have to fill is between how to reconcile the, the, the programming environment, the devices, how to manage memory, uh, how to manage uh, data, big, 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 big chunks of data that now we are not quite, uh, you know, good or not that very good to do it. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a challenge for, for, for this HPC. And I would say that uh, you know, uh, we haven't talked about this, but the quantum computing is right there as well. So, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you can imagine, you know, lots of things and lots of science fiction scenarios from now on. Okay, so let's, it, it, actually, I, I think you hit two, two very interesting aspects. One, one of them is, and I think we will go back later to it, is, is that, let's say, that the learning curve, I mean, and I think this, this was a missed opportunity in, in let's say, in, in the field of HPC, I mean, where, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the, the curve is very steep and we always thought that it's a complicated thing. So, I mean, people, people are just dumb that they don't spend the time to learn this thing. But then comes another technology, which is a fair analog to, to ours, which is machine learning, and everything is, you know, it's just working out of the box. I mean, there are several, uh, let's say, ways of doing uh, things very easy for everybody. And yeah, maybe, maybe we should learn something in the HPC community on, on that regard. I mean, we'll go back to that later. But then another aspect, which is also very relevant, I mean, you, you mentioned now, I mean, of course, breakthroughs in terms of technology, right? I mean, what's, what's, what's next, right? I mean, you mentioned quantum computing or, 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 or other, let's say, approaches, which, which might improve, let's say, uh, machine learning or neural networks. So may, maybe we, we could raise a question, I mean, what, what's, what's out there in terms of, let's say, of infrastructures, right? I mean, what, what is the computing growth, let's say, in the future? So I don't know, maybe Jose Maria, I mean, you can, you can give us, a, let's say, a hint of what's, what's coming, I mean, what, what should we expect, let's say, in terms of the roadmap? For HPC? Well, for HPC, the next step is hexaflop computers. And the main characteristic of a hexaflop computer is that uh, for sure it will have accelerators. Uh, let me to say uh, GPUs. So this means that any kind of software that you want to run in these computers, if you want to uh, use efficiently the computer, 
uh, you need to include a programming uh, of GPUs in your code. And remember that GPUs are especially specialized hardware that are very efficient to execute some instructions, but it's not a general purpose hardware. So this means that not all the algorithms will fit perfectly a hexaflow computer. If we are speaking about finite difference codes and this kind of stencil codes, these codes has not problems. They could be mapped efficiently in a GPU uh, hardware, okay? But in other areas of science, like in uh, nanoscience, in uh, condensate matter simulations, where the algorithms are plenty of indirections, these algorithms uh, will have problems to use efficiently an exaflow computer. But for the moment in geoscience, uh, we will have no problems. And also has appeared the uh, uh, quantum computing work. The first thing I, 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 I think that around quantum computer, at the present, there is an incredible bubble. Okay? Uh, quantum computer, for sure, will arrive. But for the moment, it's in a very, very early stage of the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is to have a quantum computer that is able to do something uh, useful in terms of industrial or of industry. We need something in the order of 50 qubits as minimum. Today, in the best case, probably we are in the order of 16 qubits. Okay. There are companies that say that they have 20 or 25 qubits, but it's not true. They have 16 at most. We have checked these computers and they have not 20 qubits for sure. No. And the, the problem is that uh, the first quantum computers that will appear are not general purpose devices, are not computers to program any kind of algorithm that I have in my, in my head. They will be quantum computers, but they will be used only for one specific kind of algorithms that are problems of uh, op uh, combinatorial optimization. Problems that today we solve by software, uh, usually using algorithms like simulated annealing. The quantum device will do the simulated annealing in hardware, not in software. And this represents something like a 10 at the power five of six acceleration respect to the software. So any kind of problem that is uh, solved using uh, simulated annealing will map perfectly this computer. But it's the only algorithm that this device will do. This device will never do a waveform propagation or any, any other algorithm. So these are specific purpose computers. A general purpose quantum computing Nobody knows how to build it, and nobody has technology to build this. And it's easy to understand. The main difficulty in quantum computing is the isolation of the system. A quantum system is modified just by a photon that crosses the system. So you need to have a system that is completely isolated of the external world in order to be stable and predictable. And this is but the, the physical difficulty of this today, nobody knows how to solve it. The quantum computers that we have today works at close to the absolute zero in temperature. So 270 minus 270 degrees, okay? So you can imagine that the difficulty is not the build the qubit. The difficulty is build the refrigerator system to have something at this temperature. Okay. So clearly today, this is only physics experimentation and is the basis for a future, but it's just the, the basis. So a general purpose quantum computer is not close and it probably takes decades to arrive. Okay. But for sure, what will be arrived very brief will be a specialized quantum devices that are able to solve some specific problems. This will be arrived in probably in the next five or six years. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, actually, I mean, what we are uh, seeing now is that there are technologies which kind of are stable or staples, like uh, HPC standard, uh, you know, uh, silicon-based, let's say, uh, chips. There's, let's say, also new technologies which are arising, and both in the hardware and, and, and let's say, also the software level. I mean, we are not th new things like uh, machine learning were not really prevalent, let's say, 20 years back, and there are things which are on the let's say on the radar like quantum computing which who knows when let's say this, this will happen so this for, for us researchers let's say it's a, it's okay it's kind of fun but uh, i would like to ask uh, in this case for example to Vic, as a re representative of the industry which kind of has to leverage even these technologies and at some point i guess the, you know, the industry moves and accepts a new technology as something useful or uh, say relevant to what they do and so on so what what's what do you think is, uh, let's say, Repsol's stake, or, or maybe we will kind of speak uh, say from your company, we have or your stake, let's say, on, on, on how, how these technologies are seen, let's say, or perceived, let's say, at the, at the industry. I mean, are they, are they welcome? Are they uh, uh, something scary? Is something to be worried about? What's your take on that? Yeah, okay, no, yes, that, that, that's, that's an excellent question, uh, Jose. Uh, yes, uh, and I would say, okay, let me be added value. What is the added value that uh, the technology can bring? And what is the, what is the impact? And uh, I mean, in the oil and gas industry, and you know uh, that Repsol, but also other companies, we have some targets which is related also to the impact on the environment, and we're, uh, we want to reduce our net carbon emissions uh, uh, by uh, 2050 to have it uh, neutral by, uh, to be neutral by 2050. So when we look at those technologies, we're open-minded and uh, and Jose Maria just mentioned the, the quantum. We're looking at those technologies, of course, closely. We're working with the research. We're working with, the, with you guys uh, from, from the EC, for example, and other institute uh, to, to see what could be the future and to be prepared to take this uh, to take this next step and to be ready to adopt those technologies if needed. And uh, the way we're doing it also is we're also promoting and supporting and sponsoring these kind of uh, technologies. So we're open-minded and we're not closing any door, but we're also realistic that uh, we need also to make sure that our investment in terms of manpower, in terms of resource, uh, resources in general, it could be human resources, but also financial resources, uh, are towards what can bring value, what can also be in line with our strategy. So HPC is definitely, and I'm sorry to, to re-emphasize on this one, is that it's for us it's it's a given i mean there is something that it's here it's here to stay it's here to be scaled it's here to be and we need to work on it and to adopt uh, to adjust our technology and also a mindset and also our skills going uh, to reskilling or upskilling people resources people to be able to take the maximum from those technologies and if there is a technology that is coming in the future and can really this uh, i mean collaborate with other technology we are open for it so technology for us it's a given it's the key word and maybe i'm biased because i'm from the technology lab of our Repsol, but i can tell you coming from uh, the other side of, uh, of the oil and gas industry uh, technology is a key and this is really for us the future and uh, working with uh, with uh, with researchers in this area for us it's it's key and it's not even we're not even asking the question so for, for me, it's, it's really very, very important from, from Rector's side to emphasize on this one and to keep really uh, pushing and uh, keep also uh, asking for more collaboration with, with research uh, groups uh, uh, like uh, BSC in, in this area. Okay, thank you very much. So now, I mean, also, I mean, of course, a, a fundamental part of, let's say, of research in, in all of these uh, fields is, 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 is it's public. Uh, and I mean, we, we all of us are, are, let's say, somehow benefiting, let's say, from, from public R&D funding, let's say, both at national level, European level, Mexican uh, level, in, in some cases. So, and I think that there's there's a, a huge role to be played here. And I think uh, I would like actually, actually to ask uh, Romain on, on, on this side, because I know that he's uh, also, uh, let's say, participating in uh, several consortia, let's say, which are uh, industry driven, but also in R&D projects, which are public, let's say, context. And I don't know what's 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 your feeling. I mean, what's uh, what's the, let's say your take on how funding, let's say, is affecting or let's say or, or or maybe helping us, let's say, develop technologies. My feeling is that at the moment there's, I mean, on one hand, I think there there is, let's say, uh, still are uh, things to be developed, let's say, from the public side. 
there's not a lot of love, let's say, for the oil and gas, let's say, R&D, public funded, let's say, projects at the moment for, 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 for good reason, probably. And also, and specifically, also, what's what do you think is the, the main problem when, I mean, associated with capturing, let's say, talent, let's say, around us that have to learn this very tough technologies, this very crazy ideas about imaging, about HPC, all of that. Are we, let's say, training also properly, uh, let's say, our, our, our students on, on that behalf? So, yeah. Give me your, your, your take on these issues. Uh, not, not an easy question. Um, um, I mean, uh, in fact, I, I, I do not have a clear uh, view and idea um, about uh, the future uh, uh, and how, in fact, will evolve the oil and gas companies uh, in the near future uh, with respect to the energy turn. And I think that uh, depending on the, what type of company, the trajectory could be different. So from the discussion uh, I can have, we can have with different companies, it seems that it's really company, dif company dependent. So depending about European or American companies, uh, the trajectory seems a bit different in terms of uh, time scale about uh, how they will uh, change their uh, R&D department uh, trajectories and uh, how they will make evolve uh, their uh, research uh, effort uh, towards kind of uh, technology. So, which means that uh, in terms of, um, uh, I would say, human resources strategy, uh, how to train uh, uh, people, uh, students, uh, and about, uh, uh, I would say, um, human resources of uh, companies, it's quite difficult for me to anticipate what uh, will happen in the next few years because uh, uh, at least uh, from the European companies, uh, things have moved very fast for the past two years, for example, in terms of uh, general R&D strategies uh, related to uh, exploration. Uh, so uh, difficult for me to, to really know. <laughs> It's, uh, I guess there's a lot of uncertainty out there uh, right now. I think we, we are summing up, let's say, the pandemic, which has, of course, been a random, let's say, thing for, for all industries, not 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 not, uh, not only oil and gas, but of course a trend, let's say, towards, let's say, this. Uh, it has many manifestations, but let's say the Green Deal in Europe. I mean, uh, let's say climate change activities here and there, mm -hmm. which are kind of uh, taking place. Let's say also the electrification of the. Of the Mobility or all of those things that they are, are taking bigger priorities than they had, and they probably might might, uh, might affect the, the future developments on this. So that I agree with you. There's a lot of uncertainties out there. So uh, yeah, I wanted also to ask uh, Ursula. I mean, you're you're, you're giving uh, lectures, uh, of course, at, at UNAM. I mean, you're you're also in close contact with uh, with lots of students. What's I mean? What's your feeling regarding, let's say, this this uh, this new generations being trained in algorithms, which might, let's say, ensure kind of the you know, the that this technology, the ideas that we are working on, I mean, might might live on, let's say, in the in the next decades. What's what's your take? I mean, what's what's your feeling? Are, are they are they happy to be to be trained on these things? They happy to learn? Are they are they more clever, less clever than they used to? Well, they, you have everything. I mean, you have uh, from from the ones that they don't want to learn new uh, programming languages to the ones that, you know, uh, want to be updated to the day. And um, I think the one, one positive aspect that I see from the community is the, this open open software, like uh, Julia and Python and uh, all this uh, ecosystem that comes from Python and then now Julia, Jupyter, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and with this, uh, you can share, you can share uh, Many examples that were difficult to to start from 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 zero uh, before. Now you have lots of papers that you can build from zero and and reproduce the entire paper, so you can adopt or adapt your, that that algorithm or that technology to a new problem. 
And as you as you share with with everybody, then your 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 new uh, contribution contributions could be also used by others. Uh, I think that the the well, people here in Mexico, uh, in terms of uh, uh, well research, uh, we are as you said, the pandemic has uh, changed a little bit the scenario, and now everything is focusing more in the health in the health uh, area, but also uh, there are technologies and for in, in Mexico as well. We have uh, we have now new concerns for 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 the oil, but uh, the 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 main the main interested, for example, here is is uh, is in uh, prevention, like risk uh, reduction or prevention of disaster prevention. So we have, for example, a new project on distributed acoustic sensing, the DAS data. And the DAS data, uh, the, the idea is to have a, a, a survey of DAS data here in Mexico City, in, close to the metro stations, and to be able to do like imaging of the shallow layers in the city. And, and it's, it's relatively cheap and it's not invasive. Uh, and, and the technology you need is the same that you use for full waveform inversion in the oil industry. Uh, so uh, we have like, uh, well, we can do that, so we can do seismic or uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's okay. The purposes are slightly different, but the, the technology, the algorithms are the same. So it's an advantage uh, and we are well taking advantage of that because now we have a project on that. So we have to move towards that. And the students, for example, um, they're also uh, trying to pay attention because to find a job nowadays is very difficult. And, and also I think that one thing that we are, we are, we are watching is uh, how uh, like small, very tiny companies made by two, three, four, five people uh, are, are built and they are offering uh, different services for for big data analysis, for example, or or these kind of things that you would never imagine. And now, our, I'm not saying that they will be successful, but this is uh, a uh, kind of way to to have some temporary jobs for 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 young people. Um, so that's what I I have seen so far. Yeah, that's that's very true. Actually, there's, there's, there's two things are, are are both relevant, and one of them is that uh, kind of the a democratized, let's say, way of, uh, let's say, of, of, of working in geosciences, right? I mean, that's uh, kind of, it looks like uh, anybody can, let's say, go out there and, you know, and try something because, you know, codes, are, there's a lot of open source out there. I can run something with a, with a smaller set of data and people can get to produce things, which may, maybe was not like that. I mean, like 20 years back, I mean, we, we, it, no. it like we really needed a huge team to do things and now things are getting kind of, uh, uh, building on the digital technology world, I mean, you, you don't need so much manpower, which is, which is good, I guess. Yeah, that's and the, that's the that's reproducibility. Yeah. That's the that's the key thing, I think, the reproducibility. Um, it saves a lot of time. Uh, and I remember that I, I first came across to a paper by Jose Carchone, uh, and I was trying to reproduce the paper. Uh, and it took me some time to be able to reproduce it. And then and then I was able to do it. And I think, oh, this is a very good paper because I was able to do it. But now you can find the code for, 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 for some of these papers. And you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to do it. But you have it there. And then you can learn from there. And it's much faster. Uh, and that obviously speed ups the, 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 the new developments. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's, that's um, a trend. I think it's, it came to stay. So hopefully, I mean, we'll see more. More open science. So now, now related also to, to the other things that you were mentioning, like the, the outcome of, let's say, of newer data set, cheaper data acquisition, things like this. So, I mean, geophysical exploration, we always kind of, we are focusing here a lot in, let's say, in oil and gas, which obviously is the, let's say, the, the most uh, let's say, relevant asset in terms of money, and you know, it's very economically intensive. But as you mentioned, I mean, this technology that we use there, I mean, they use to other subsurface exploration, let's say, problems, which are also relevant, might make, uh, let's say, also big money and, and might also, let's say, have an impact. Right? We can think of, at, at the very least, geothermal energy uh, resources, both finding them and managing them. Uh, we can think of uh, carbon sequestration uh, efforts. They're always in the background. There's never a big move on that, but, you know, 
there's, there's always and also and also you mentioned you mentioned um, not today but oh, I don't remember but uh, medical applications are the ones that you were working with. You, you can do that too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but let's say in, 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 in the context, let's say of the of subsurface, let's say which uh, don't want just to, to, to stay on the, let's say on the Mexico's uh, uh, environment. I think another one which is not not very often talked about, but it's very relevant is uh, is, is fresh water. Right. I mean. There's, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, let's say, a forecast of, of fresh water being a huge problem in the future, let's say, because of you know, uh, climate uh, warming and, let's say, uh, dense populations, let's say, living in locations where water is scarce. So ha does anybody of you work on, on this kind of other, let's say, sides of subsurface exploration, kind of geothermal, water, uh, uh, carbon sequestration? Anybody of you has some experience on that? Is transferring technology from oil and gas to there and want to share? I, I did. I did. Uh, I did a similar, similar, um, similar work with an aquifer in Florida, and uh, the data. The data was the same. The seismic data, and I. I we wanted to to see the porosities and the permeabilities. And we we did, I did the same kind of thing that I presented today for the oil field, but for the aquifer in Florida. Yeah. That might become more valuable than oil in the in the future. We'll, we'll see yes, we'll see yes, of course, yes, yes, yes. Now, now no, nobody's paying much attention, but it will be crucial. I mean, <laughs> very important. A matter of of that of life or death. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's very important. Okay. So Romain, some experience on your side on this uh, field? So, so we, we are working uh, on our side on the CO2 sequestration also. Um, and, uh, but I would say that for CO2 sequestration and geothermal, I would say that uh, most of technology that have been developed for oil and gas reservoir is, uh, I would say, directly uh, uh, applicable. So. There is no real uh, changes in the type of targets, uh, so so that's why uh, I think that uh, we, as academia and also the energy company, are, are also looking in this direction because uh, the, the most of the knowledge that have been acquired and accumulated over years for oil and gas reservoir as a direct application for geothermal and uh, CO2 sequestration. Um, uh, and uh, for the, I mean, uh, in terms of application, I think there is also some key uh, application of uh, such kind of technology at the very near surface for civil engineering and uh, near surface soil characterization um, related to uh, seismic risk and uh, or landscape uh, risk management. Uh, so uh, there are some uh, application of such kind of technology at the near surface, but uh, 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 mostly uh, limited by the acquisition of uh, reliable and dense data. So in such kind of frame, uh, the development of uh, distributed uh, acoustic sensors could be uh, something quite appealing in the, in the future to have denser and cheaper uh, access to uh, uh, large scale data to apply FWI like technology because uh, today uh, it's I do think that the, the, the key limitation for near surface is not HPC but it's really data amount and data quality so and for uh, many new building uh, uh, and the management of risk, uh, this would be a, a key point. Uh, just to come back on the water reservoir and the aquifer, uh, I think that uh, seismic alone is maybe not the, the, the best option, but uh, to come back on the very first question of uh, uh, Jose Maria at the beginning, combining with uh, electromagnetic and other physics, uh, there, there is clearly something that to, to work on uh, for the near future to uh, combine uh, diffusive electromagnetic, propagative electromagnetic with maybe seismic. So in the kind of multi-physics workflow that could take benefit of everything that has been developed for seismic uh, FWI. I think this is something that would be really appealing in the, in the future. You're very right. We, we we skipped quite a lot of electromagnetic methods today. I mean, but I mean they've always been kind of the, you know, the 
the poor brother, let's say, to seismic in, 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 in geophysics for oil and gas, and for a reason, let's say also. But that's true. I mean, as we get shallower, to it's become a bigger part. I mean, you might want to actually go into EM, especially if, if cost is important, if acquisition yes. cost is something relevant, then, then they really the, you know that the, the interest in EM methods goes uh, quite high up. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's very true. All right. Um, so just, I mean, I, I wanted us to make an, an, another open question to, to all of you. I mean, how, how do you see, let's say, uh, computational geophysics five years from now? I mean, do you imagine like a public uh, project funding us or, you know, our, our, you know the, the people which come after us in five years? I mean, given the current economic situation, climate expectations, do you think this will uh, go on for, for quite a long time or, or, or we will... We'll see a transformative, let's say, difference in, in, in what we're doing five years from now. Just not not to not to play the, the you know the the sorcerer here. So, what's your take on this? Yeah, I guess. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Because I I, yeah. I lost the video. Yes. Yeah. yeah so, before moving to this one, let me just. Uh, I mean, the the point you mentioned before. It's very very interesting, and uh, and I can tell you that now the the, the role of uh, the geophysics and um, it's also in terms of uh, the risk in some of the projects and uh, also in terms of uh, educating the public when it comes to, uh, you mentioned geothermal, you mentioned CO2. Uh, those are very, very sensitive topics. And uh, definitely the, the, the geophysics and all the, the advances we're doing thanks to HPC are used a lot and will be more, and we need to kind of uh, democratize this uh, kind of knowledge. So to gain a trust from the local, uh, from in, in remote areas, but also from population remote areas, but also since we will be developing those kind of technology like uh, storage of hydrogen, like geothermal, and geothermal could be in my neighborhood or it could be uh, at a small scale in my neighborhood, or it could be bigger scale. So it, it, it's really important. And the geophysics will be even more important, will play even even a bigger role, which will lead me to, to the, the question you mentioned is what will be the computational geophysics in the future? I mean, I mean, really, we need to, 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 to be very, very careful and to be more open to, uh, uh, I mean, and having those R&D or public, uh, public, uh, public uh, labs and R&D collaborating a lot and open to uh, to, to, uh, to, to the public and to the local communities uh, to make sure that they feel and they see that the geophysics here and computational geophysics here is here to help and understand and the risk and make sure that we get more added value. It could be for oil and gas, but it could also be for plumb monitoring for CO2, make sure nothing is gonna happen in the next uh, decades or next uh, century, or also for geothermal or for the storage of uh, hydrogen. And I'm, I'm mentioning the storage of hydrogen because uh, it's also another topic that uh, the Cerepsor is exploring and making sure that when we store it, we'll be able to go and get it. And when we store it and get it, there is nothing who is gonna happen in terms of all the buildings that are uh, that are uh, on top of this kind of storage. So I see computational geophysics with more challenges, but even more important. And the, the goal or the mandate we'll be having for the geophysics will be even higher and broader spectrum than just doing the research and uh, developing new algorithms. Thank you very, very much. So I, I don't know if uh, anybody has some final remark, uh, something which, which was left untouched and you would like to, to add to, the, to this round table. Any critical point that was missed? Well, I have a, a comment. Today is in the newspaper everywhere. It's very usual say, we are not going to use more oil. The cars will be electric, the planes will be electric, everything will be electric. And I think this is like the quantum computing. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, there is a lot of things that will be electric. Um, probably cars in the cities in 10 years, all of them will be electric. But uh, how we are going to make trucks to be electric? Uh, how we can do airplanes that uh, in a reasonable time cross the ocean to other continent to be electric? It's clear that in the future we are continuing using oil for some things. Um, in, this, in this way, I, I think that uh, 
R&D in geophysics will continue to be important. Uh, there are some economical questions. Countries like Arabia Saudi that can obtain oil without using full way for inversion because the oil that they have is very easily to access. It can, uh, can fool the demand in the world or not. Uh, and also it's a strategic question. Uh, we want that uh, all our dependency in oil is concentrated in some countries that could be unstable. So I think that uh, today oil and gas seems an industry in decadence, but I think that uh, this is not true. That this decadence in any case will be very, very long because oil is a critical matter for our civilization. We cannot live uh, as we live uh, without oil. Yeah, yeah, transformations ahead, it, that's, it's, it's very clear that I mean, there's one thing is what we would like to, uh, no, that the world we would like to live in, and the other thing is the world that we you know, constrained by physics, thermodynamics, and, and such, which is a, is a different one. And, 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 and I agree with you that there are many, many things which need to be done before, let's say, committing politically to, to this and that. Okay, there, there, are, let's see, there are rules and to how things work, uh, which be accomplished and i think a key factor is what you mentioned i mean if, if we want to live the, the, the life we have right and, and that's a key component i mean whether we will be able to do that let's say or, or let's say things will uh, go very wrong in the future just because of let's say of not having uh, let's say forecasted that we might need these resources a little bit longer in order to produce something which can replace them which probably we didn't do uh, as of yet all right so uh Thanks, all of you. I mean, I think we, we, we had uh, some very great contributions. We touched many aspects which are critical to, let's say, to, to the world of geophysics, to the world of, uh, of, uh, of HPC. So th thank you very much. I would like to remind you two things. First off, uh, the, you, you received the survey. Hopefully, uh, all participants have already uh, participated into that. So um, also, I wanted now to, to catch your attention, not leave just yet, because we have a, a small surprise uh, prepared with, together with uh, Mireya. We have a, a, a very funny game that we can play, I think. Uh, so if you have the, the moment, and, and Mireya can help you in that, what we can do is something for which you will need, uh, first of all, your mobile phones. You will need to go to the menti.com page. Uh, let's, let's write it here for everybody. Menti.com. So I'm going to try to make a test for this. And this is just a quiz game, OK, that we can play and, and see whether or not people uh, have uh, understood or followed or, okay, or, or what we did today was clear enough, OK? So uh, is Mireya here? Or I don't see yes, here. here. Yes, hello. So uh, we had the test, the, the very first test, okay? So yes. I'm now having this presentation here in front of me at the, at the Mentimeter. Mm -hmm. And I think I just have to uh, click on present for it to run. Yes, but you have to share your screen also. Okay. So I'm going to do that uh, right now. Hopefully you can see in here. Yes. This. So mm -hmm. the idea is that you get this code here into the web, right? Mm -hmm. If anybody, if everybody's there, and you just test for these questions, are obviously a very tiny one. Okay, just just put, to make sure that everybody can can do that. I mean, hopefully nobody has difficulties with this. You let me know if somebody has problems accessing this menti.com and putting their code and and, and and participating. Just let us know. Is it working for you? I should have here information about the people voting and such, but I'm not getting anything. I'm completely sure this is working this time. It says you didn't vote in time. Yes. Oh, because you were late. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good because this, this was just a test. So now we're going to do the good one. All right. Uh, so let's move to the end to the, the real okay, uh, scenario here, which is somewhere back there. Stay with me for a moment. You have to go to my presentations, I think. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Here, here it is. Here. Okay, let's play this one. 
So you will see a new code, right? So you will need to, to introduce that one. Okay. It's loading up here. There it is. 75801347. You let me know if you can do that. I think you can do that also in the no, in the in the browser, right? You know, just say yes. Why, but just because we, we should do that live, you know, and you should not have your uh, laptops in front of you because everything is virtual. You can use any any of the million screens around you to do this probably. All right. Uh, so just uh, to avoid any you know any, any dirty competition and such, this is just I mean the only goal here is just satisfaction. Okay, there's no big prize, there's no money involved. Sorry, guys, <laughs> you don't need to feel like you to to win here. Okay, so let's start. Should we? I mean, oh, we only have two people here connected. What's what's going on? Let's. Is is anybody having problems uh, using this thing? Not from my side. Okay, three people loading. Not many. Actually, I'm thinking it is only the, the round table participants so far. It's going to be <laughs> only three, four people. Just menti.com, this code, that's all you need. Let's give you two more minutes. Five people, that's already increasing. That's good. Six people, that's that's much better. Let's, let's wait until, I don't know, 10 at least. You don't need to insert your, your real name. Right? You, can, you, can, you can have any name you're, you're comfortable with. Doesn't matter later on, we will, we will review, uh, review who did what. Okay, so should we start? Let's, let's, uh, let's, okay, eight. I mean, we're now getting a, a lot of attention here. Let's start with this one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's start with the arrow here. I, mean, I always have this problem with this web. There we go. That should be, should appear a question. You have some time to answer, okay? Oh, 13 people, okay, that's gonna be a competition. That's that's the icons you chose, actually. <laughs> you guys are crazy, okay. Uh, there we go. Time is ticking. First question, an increase of doubling frequency in geophysical simulation results in competing costs. There are the same, double, 10 times higher, 16 times higher. Only one good answer here. Tick tock, tick tock. Six people answer. Clock is ticking. Dun, dun. All right. Okay. So six people actually got the right answer for the first one. Double. Ah, that would be too easy, right, guys? The same. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I probably just <laughs> hit the wrong button. Okay, let's go with the next one. Let's see what's what's next here. Question two. I mean, this have been given actually questions from the presenters, eh? so that's uh, we are to to blame for this one. Okay, let's start. What is the function of the gamma test? What is the purpose? I guess right. Is related to the gamma ray well logs, or it works to select the best combination of inputs to train the neural network. I guess, or works as a data conditioner. What's what is it? Tick tock, tick tock. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, so on one side, it, it is good that seven people, I mean, that the most people uh, made the, no, the, the correct answer, but as many people did the wrong answers. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I should, we should be proud of that. Okay, let's, let's go on. All right. Question three, ready? On your keyboards. Machine learning tools help us to perform. Okay, classification or regression or clustering or all the other answers. So which one is it? Talk. I see. Are you listening properly to the presentations? You must vote it. Okay. That was good. Hey, yeah. Great. yeah, you were either you are a good teacher or or, or they, they, they came well studied. Yeah. We'll see to that. That's very good, actually. Okay, let's go. Question four. Let's see, let's see what we get. Okay, that's a long one. About the resolution power, wave number fill in of classical FWL dev, which answer is more true? So there can be two which are true. 
So low K is smooth, high K is detailed. So reflections feel low K, so smooth velocity and transmission feel high K, or transmission feel low K and velocity reflection feel high K, or both reflections and transmissions fit all the scales of K. Only one correct. Keep in mind, low K is smooth, high K is detailed structure. Which one, which one, which one? Time's up. Let's see. Okay. Wow, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> Let's say, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, it, I mean, at least no other question got more votes, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very official. All right, that was a tough one. I think it was long, but that's, that's also an issue, right? I mean, people were kind of uh, reading and interpreting what, 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 what should I say? Okay, that was a tricky one. Still, people, I mean, they, they did a good job. All right, that's the last one. Question five, get ready. So which scheme best describes the RWI scheme, which is a two-step automated workflow for detailed impedance, IP and smooth velocity VP models? So it's uh, one, build IP for fixated VP and two, update VP with mismatch on reflections or build VP from low frequency and then build IP from high frequency or build VP from transmissions and build IP from reflections. So one of them is correct. What would it be? There you go. What's up? Okay, we'll see. Oh, oh, <laughs> that, that was that probably was the, the winner deciding question. <laughs> Very few people got this one right. Okay, so it was build IP for fixed VP and then update VP with mismatch on reflections. Sorry, guys, you have to pay more attention. Of course, uh, the third uh, uh, talk always people are in, get their attention and are a little bit off guard. So Congratulations to those three, which which got the, the right question uh, answer. Even if it was statistically just by it or by creating a random uh, answer, I mean, which which also works on that. Okay, so let's see what happened here. I mean, who's going to be the winner? Dun, dun, dun. Okay, yeah, that was the point. That was the points. Oh, 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 Romain, come on. That was that was an abuse. I, I I think that you were one of the three guys that knew the answer to the last one. So yeah. Congratulations also on the icon. I like very much this, uh, the alien uh, thing in there. 4,000 points. But uh, actually, we had some some nice uh, also results in the background, right? I mean, so Max, uh, Jose, I mean, other people got quite some points. So thank you all for participating. As promised, no, sorry, no no prizes here. Just uh, the pride and honor of being the winner of the quiz of the Subsurface Exploration in Mexico uh, webinar, which is no small feat. So. Thank you, everyone, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the, and, 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 and you appreciated also this, you know, this, 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 this part of, let's say, of relaxation towards the end of today's meeting. I learned a lot uh, with all of you. I think it was interesting. I think we got to tackle many uh, very relevant topics, and, and yeah, we got to see a glimpse of the future probably of geophysics and, and HPC. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, especially Mireya for helping organizing this. Uh, Jose Maria helping uh, with the management of the first part of the session. All the speakers, of course. And thanks uh, also uh, to Fik for joining us for the roundtable. And to everybody listening, I think this was uh, very exciting. And so thanks for being there, contributing. And yeah, hopefully there will be other events in five years' time. Let's be optimistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks nice a lot. Bye bye. See you next time. See you soon.